All right, welcome, welcome. You guys excited? No, that's like three people. Come on, are you guys excited? Come on, Jesus is here. I'm here. You, gotta, you should be excited. Yeah, Dan said, you know what, Joey, I just felt like the Lord said, just teach tonight, so you teach, so here I am. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, forgive me, Lord. Uh, all right, so I just want to introduce Dan. I know, I know for a lot of you, uh, I'm hoping a lot of you have never heard of Dan, besides just the name, um, because this weekend's going to be really powerful. And it was about, I want to say six or seven years ago, I had just been saved and and I saw this crazy guy on YouTube, a group of our friends, this crazy guy named Todd with these dreadlocks. And, I, and he would be laying hands on people. And so it was only appropriate that we went and tried the same thing. And God was healing people. And so we found out that Todd was coming into town in, in Orange County for this power and love event. I didn't, it's the first time I ever heard power and love. I was like, that's pretty catchy. It, it works. And so we go to this event and there's this, and I didn't even know who Dan was. But there was this pivotal moment that really that the Lord just used Dan to just pierce my heart. It was, and you, you, I didn't even share this on our way over here, but there was this moment where there was this lady and I believe her son was suffering with something, like he couldn't walk or, or he, he was autistic or something. And Dan and Todd had sat there for about an hour just praying for him on the steps of the stage and he didn't get healed. And so many times we've seen pastors and we've seen preachers give them a reason why they didn't get healed and kind of just that, that, that thing of letting down. We just let them down. Well, we don't know what God's doing, you know? But I didn't hear that out of Dan. Todd kept praying, but Dan, I kept hearing for like 20 minutes him just pour into her and her giving her every single reason to keep believing why it was God's will to heal her son, even if it didn't happen in that moment. And that, that, that totally rocked my world because it was the first time I ever heard a minister or someone that just loved Jesus stir someone else up in a moment of just like, desperation and a loss of hope. And then I went on for the next year or two listening to the Harvest Chapel schools. Dan's got a teaching online. And, and it was one thing that just rocked me was his revelation of just Romans 7, that we're no longer sinners. And I remember hearing it for the first time. I was like, there's no way. This guy is crazy. Because my life and my experience taught me otherwise. And as I kept listening and I kept going, okay, Lord, I, there's something here that I've never heard before. The Lord began transforming me. And I just, you know, Dan's here this weekend. I just want to give honor to where honor is due. Will you just welcome Dan Muller up to the stage right now, please? I did it. Thank you. Thanks, guys. I'm going to grab this. I got it. No, it's, I can handle that. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Man, you sound excited tonight. Man, this is a puffy carpet. I should go like, oh, my, I'm going to move it over here so I don't knock it over. Everybody doing good? Man, how about that worship team up here? The songs. You got to really think about what you're singing. These guys get it. I, that's, what I, that's what I was so blessed the first time I met you. I saw the songs and I saw the words and I said, wow. Somebody understands. This is good. So praise God. Awesome. Well, I'm glad to be here. Man, a bunch of folks showed up, huh? Can't see. I'm in the light. You guys are like, you guys got to walk in the light as he's in the light. Wait. I'm going, like, come out of the darkness. Come on. No, I'm just kidding. So uh, how many people are from right here? This is your hometown. Let me see. Raise your hand. <laughs> wow. They're happy about it too. Good, good. So, man, awesome. Man, I got some things stirring in my heart. We're going to have fun. We're going to, uh, how about, I honestly believe this. I honestly believe one of the highest graces in my life is just the impartation of truth and just to share, teach what Jesus accomplished and what God intended and who we really are now that he came. And, and then at the end, I, I we'll just shift a gear and pray for the sick. How's that sound? I just feel like we can pray for the sick. I was last week in a place, kept it real simple at the end. We prayed for the sick, and I don't pray for anybody. I'm not lining you all up. I'm going to get you guys to help me because this is an empowering weekend. Like, ministers should be empowering. Like, for years, I would just do everything. I'd pray for people. I, I had so much fun with gifts. I, I would just line people up, and I thought it was awesome. And after a while, it's like it just impresses people, but nobody's transformed to live that way. They're just touched by the gift. 
So it makes you kind of like a hero to people. Or they're like, whoa, you know. I remember just lining people up. And I'd I, I had altar calls where I said, don't tell me why you came up. But I wasn't empowering people. I wasn't teaching on how to hear God and get closer to God. They were just impressed with relationship and how gifts can flow. And people got touched and stuff. But everybody left. And then they thought, man, we ought to have Dan back. It's, that's not why I'm here. I'm not here even so that you like, yay, Dan. I mean, that's awesome, and you seem happy, but I know you guys love Jesus. I can see it on you, you know? And, uh, but it's, 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 it's about empowering us and teaching and training and equipping for the work of the ministry. It's not about a gifting or a ministry gift or a fivefold to do all this stuff and pray for everybody. And I mean, for years we got in the habit at the end of a service, everybody just come to the speaker, line up, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. Tonight we're going to have everybody pray for everybody. And I'm telling you, God's going to do stuff in this room. And there's nothing nobody can do about it. You can't even work up enough unbelief to stop it. I'm just telling you. Because it's just the way it's going to be. But last week, this guy's 34 years, extreme pain. 34 years. That's a lot of years. That's a Bible story, guys. Prayed for, he told me a couple hundred times, if you could even count. He said he learned to live with the pain. He was on high levels of pain meds. And that's the best he could bend. He had severe stuff going on. And I don't know, one or two people just ran to him and said, hey, we're going to stand with you. I gave you a simple little teaching. I only let you pray. I'm going to do it tonight. I'm going to let you pray for six seconds. It's for your sake. You can't get in trouble in six seconds. You can't even get self-conscious. You can't try too hard. Come on, be honest when you pray for the sick. Who's ever prayed for the sick and you got more conscious about what you were saying and how you were praying than what you were believing and his love for the person? Be honest. Let me see a show of hands if you can relate to that, that you got self-conscious when you prayed for the sick. That would be a problem, right? If you're self-conscious when you pray for the sick, because then if the sick do change or get healed and you were self-conscious, you might think it was something you did right. It's something he did right. It's, it's your faith in him. It's what you believe about what he accomplished in his love for the person. Come on, faith works through love. Not because you prayed right or prayed powerful or amplified the name of Jesus. 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 We've tried that stuff, man. Change the pitch on the shofar. I'm just saying. So we prayed for six seconds. It had nothing to do with people sometimes. They sometimes people say, well, yeah, but Dan, you need to face it. You carry some. We're under the umbrella of what you carry, and it's happening because you're there. No, no. In all you're getting, get understanding. When you can release people from the stronghold of self-consciousness, the kingdom can flow free. When you get people not thinking about themselves, but thinking about Christ in them, the hope of glory. Yeah? yeah? yeah. Glory. You know the word glory, very simply, means any manifest, made, seen, or known attribute of God. Any demonstration of who God is, is the glory of God revealed. So the Christ in you is the hope of God being seen and known. The Christ in you. Amen? So they ran over and with a simple teaching, like I had six seconds to pray, 34 years, a guy's been suffering for years and he's been prayed for hundreds of times in desperation, in need. That's what, you know, right? In this simple teaching, in this simple six-second period, boom, his whole body changed. He was the first to testify. He was really touched. He came up the next day, told me all about it, and he went down. He was, I'm guessing he was in his low 70s. He's 34 years. Uh, he's been sick and hurt. Bend over and touch. He just... Psh, Touched the floor. He just, he just straight down like that. And before we prayed, that's all he could do right there. Excruciating pain. Shoop, no pain. He gets up. He goes, whoa. And, and then Saturday, he's doing it and testifying. Sunday, he's doing it and testifying. And it's like, Jesus, you're just really good. So there's something there for us to step into. Guys, it fascinates me. Brandon and I were talking about this today. We tend to say we get religious and we say, well, you know, isn't it's all in God's good time. Come on. God could be willing something the whole time and you just don't see. God 
could be saying yes and you just don't see. God could be saying yes and in your heart you somehow believe it's no. See, he gave the earth to the children of men. We co-labor with him. We walk with him. He works through us. And in all our getting, we got to get understanding. That's why we do these kind of services. That's at least why I get on a plane and travel. They ask me to come. I pick out some places and I say yes and I travel. Every weekend I'm somewhere. And I have fun. I have a blast. I, you don't have no idea how much fun I had just standing here listening to those lyrics and looking around and watching you guys excited. I mean, I, have, I worship. I'm not distracted. I, I find joy in it. I look around. I see certain people. There was a young lady over here. I don't want to embarrass her, but she was over here. I could pick her out. And I was like, oh. She was just, she never looked. She was just... And I'm like, I mean, she was just going, man. I'm like, gee. And I just get blessed by that. I just, I just like that. So I have fun everywhere I go. I'm, I don't draw an identity from teaching. I don't even have a need to be up here in front of you. I'm going to be blessed no matter where I am. Jesus is Lord. And we've got to find our identity in Him and stay solid in Him. Amen? You don't, you don't, you're not drawing identity from what you do in the Lord. You draw identity from who you are in the Lord. And who you are in the Lord is what produces what you do in the Lord. That's a healthy wellspring, guys. That's a cup running over. It'll never go dry. All right? Because if I'm finding my identity out of preaching, I'm only doing as good as you think I'm preaching. Now I'm under pressure to preach better. And... Serious. You can know who you are in Him, people a lot of young folks here and it's not just for the young folks I know there's a lot of pressure to measure up fit in and what's cool what isn't and who's who and who's not and we always seem to think it's the young folks but I tell you I see people middle age going through the same insecurities and crises the reason I addressed young folks is it would be great for you to get it now that's what would be great I'm not focusing on you saying you need it more I we, you know, people talk about, you know, just the whole sexual thing and promiscuity and these kids and this generation. And I'm thinking, I don't know. I see the 40s and 50 year olds doing the same stuff when they got the opportunity. And I'm like, I think we're pointing a finger or something. I, I pastored for a while and I'm like, what's up? It ain't the young folks. It's everybody that doesn't know Jesus to the full. <laughs> I'm just saying, I don't know what I'm doing right now. But don't, don't get uncomfortable. <laughs> We just kind of blame the young people. We say, hey, this young generation, I think this young generation has amazing potential and, and God, and I'm not just trying to get a shout, so don't just shout, but I'm telling you, God's doing something in you young folks. I, I travel all over, weekend after weekend. There is young folks that you can't count. It's just, there's, there's so many of them and their eyes are shining, they're excited, and they're glad to be growing in God. And it excites me. Yeah, it does. It excites me. Thumbs up. So if we can get this revelation inside and he become your strength, your stronghold, your identity, your reason for being. See, this little thought hit me when I first stepped up here about our identity. I didn't know we were going to jump in at this quick, but I'm just going to go with this. You can only truly find who you really are through him. That has to be first. And I'll explain it. That's not just a religious Christian line I'm throwing you there. You really find yourself... Nothing was made that wasn't made through Him. He was there from the beginning. You're the intention of Him. Like, you're His intention. He intentionally made man. You're not happenstance. You're not just here because two people came together. You get that? He intended man. And He designed man to be a certain way and... And see, when man fell, when man sinned, man got separated from who he was created to be. He got cut off from the vine. He got separated from the source of love. He came in need of love. He became very self-centered, self-focused, very flesh. Yeah? And the trouble is, there's, there, it doesn't have to be trouble, but the trouble's been we were born into that lie trained by it, taught by it, and think it's normal and how everybody is. So we think the emotions we grew up experiencing are normal and it's the way God made us. No, no, it's the way we became. It's, we were born into Adam, people. And you must be born again. So if we're not careful, we turn born again 
into a message that benefits me instead of transforms me. And all of a sudden I'm praying a prayer to go to heaven or to get blessings instead of new life. The Bible says to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. If you look that up, you know what it means? Thinking like you've never thought before. So how can you bring the same emotions, the same motives, the same perspectives, the same reasons for being into a new life? See, the gospel takes you out of the picture in the sense that, yes, you're very important, but it's Christ in you that's important. You follow what I'm saying? This is huge and important. So you don't incorporate him into your life, he becomes your life. And he's a new and living way. You're not conformed to the world. You're transformed by the renewing, thinking like you never thought before. I've had countless people when I preach over the years, not so much anymore, I've addressed it so much, but in the beginning, and they kind of frustrated sometimes because their hearts are sincere and they want what you're saying and they, they instead of hearing it to become it, they hear it and compare and, and then they judge themselves and they come a little frustrated. You can tell when somebody's not hearing with a healthy ear because they're getting frustrated. They're measuring themselves for where they're not instead of where they're growing. And they'll come in a little testy. <laughs> It's like, well, it just, I don't know, you make it sound so simple. I mean, we do have feelings. You know what, am I supposed to just be a robot and just turn off all my feelings and shut down all my emotions? Because, I mean, God gave us emotions. He gave us emotions. And I'm like, <laughs> he gave us emotions, but not the ones you grew up with. Adam gave you those. The emotions, watch this. The, this is going to help somebody. The emotions you grew up with are flowing out of a self-centered, self-focused foundation. Nobody had to teach you to be angry. It just came naturally. It's part of the fall. Nobody had to teach you. You didn't have to study on jealousy and pass. Come on. Comparison, insecurity, low esteem. You just let somebody laugh at you and mock you when you're in grade school age. And two other kids giggle behind them. And right there, you start getting identified and molded and shaped by the moment. And depending on you and your personality and your background or whatever, depending on how you respond, you become broken and insecure or a fighter and harden up. And the moment starts shaping you instead of Christ. By a short time in and at a very young age, you're already being fashioned by life outside instead of life that wants to be on the inside. And all of a sudden, you're nothing more than a product of what you've been through, experienced, and encountered, and how you've responded. And we think we're our own the whole time. We think we're in control. Something's deciding everybody. You can be in unforgiveness, and unforgiveness is sculpting you every day. And you think because you cut the person off, you're winning. Just the fact that you're cutting them off and the thought that you're hard towards them, every day that thing has influence in your life and is part of shaping you. Every day. Why? Because unforgiveness keeps the offense alive. Forgiveness renders as if it never happened. And it's affecting you. And you think you're winning by shutting them down, and the whole time it's deciding you. You see that? Nobody's just in control, I promise you. Nobody's just driving the car. Something's deciding who folks are. And for the Christian, Jesus becomes your identity. He becomes your fulfillment, your completeness. You, and I'm going to teach it. I'm going to be real fair to you tonight and teach how you find your identity through him because you start to understand why he came. And why he really did what he did. And I don't know about you, when I was young, nobody taught me in my circle. They just said I was a sinner and I need to believe on him so I can go to heaven. And I better stay in church because he's coming. And when he comes, I better be in church. And I was thinking, wonder if he comes and, I, and they ain't even having church service. I hope he waits. I guess he's smart enough to come when we're having service. <laughs> when you're young, you think stuff like that. All I was ever taught 
was he died on the cross because I'm a sinner. He died on the cross because I'm a sinner. And just made me conscious that I'm a sinner that needed forgiven. So, okay, great, I'm forgiven, but I'm still a sinner. I'm still the same man. Still have the same defiling desires. I still have the same emotions. If you just leave me a sinner, a forgiven sinner, I can't change. And now there's a mystery wrapped around the gospel that's supposed to be revealed. And all of a sudden, I got more questions than answers, and I'm wondering why he cares. Why does he even want me in heaven? Why is he busy forgiving me when I don't even know him or think if he's real sometimes? Did you ever have that or was it just me growing up that thought stuff like that? Or was, was somebody else understanding out here? Yeah? Did you ever get puzzled like why he would pay such a crazy high price as putting his son on the cross and why Jesus would do it just to pay the bill so you could go into heaven someday? Like where's the attraction? Is he that lonely? Like does he need a friend that bad? That he's willing just to forgive us. See, the fact is, we talk about forgiveness so much, but we forget to talk about change. And then when we do talk about change, because people talked about change from religion and works and legalism and all these craziness, then we're almost afraid to talk about change. But I talk about change all the time. It's not religion, it's not works, it's not legalism that changes me. It's his love, it's the truth. Truth makes you free. You start realizing God never lost sight of what he made man to be and who he made man to be. And he values that truth so much that he'd put on flesh and stay inside a woman till it was time and be born of a woman and come out as a man and do everything as a man and fulfill what a man failed. Captain of our salvation, the perfect sacrifice. The gospel is so good. It says, for God so loved the world. It doesn't say he was so frustrated that he finally sent his son. Or he was at wit's end and couldn't deal with humanity anymore, so he played the ace card. He loved you and me. See, nobody ever taught me in my life that Jesus died on the cross to redeem my value. They always said he died on the cross because I was a sinner. Now I understand he had to die. My sin cost him death. But he rose from the dead for my justification. And I start realizing, wait a minute, he died to restore something, not just forgive something. Oh, come on. This thing doesn't stop with forgiveness. Are you kidding me? That's why people's hearts get dull and hard or condemned or inwardly shameful because they don't have a revelation of his goodness that begins to change their life. So they just live forgiven, keep doing the same things and wonder how much he can just forgive. Your heart grows dull. Your mind gets something happens in there because you're not made to live that way. And you don't want to reduce the gospel that, oh, well, he forgives us, he loves us anyway, go live it up, friend. No, that's not, he, there's so many scriptures and he's not a legalist. There's so many scriptures, he says, come out from among them and be ye separate. You're in the world, you're not of the world. You're either for me or you're against me. Gather to me or you scatter. He who loves the world and the things of the world, for the things of the world, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life, doesn't have the love of the Father in them. They're intense scriptures. But what they point to is people not knowing who they are and who they are through what he's done. He's not saying shape up. He's saying understand. I, I'm telling you, this gospel, do you understand I've been saved for 22 years and I can hardly preach it and not freak out? Like, I have to purposely think about calming down. And if it's a show, I'm a real good actor. Somebody ought to give me an Emmy or something. Because I feel this thing. Like, like, he died on a cross, right? That's what we say. No, I think he went inside a woman and was born. He came through her birth canal. He was a little baby dependent on her. He didn't take a shortcut. He did it as a man. There's something about man that he's redeeming, that he's restoring, and we better not miss it and just make it an Easter story. 
Come on, he did it as a man. There's a man at the right hand of Almighty God. Flesh and bone. He rose from the dead. He said, touch me, for a spirit doesn't have flesh and bone as I. He's telling you he's still a man. (sighs) Name above every name. King of kings and Lord of lords. But a man. The book of Timothy says there's one mediator between God and man, and he's the man, capital M, A-N. And his blood is on the mercy seat in the holy place. Not made with hands. The heavenly tabernacle. The blood of the Son of God. He took his own blood and he put the blood of Jesus Christ, the blood of a man, on the mercy seat in the heavenly tabernacle. And there's mercy toward man through his blood. And then he sat down on that blood, on the mercy seat, forever sat down at the right hand of God to say, I'm going to sit here and assure that I'm well able to keep the word I've promised and what my blood is speaking. And he makes intercession for man forever. She, we must mean a lot to God. I don't think he said, oh, you poor guys, you need forgiveness. No, he said, you're so much more. You're living under a lie. You're making it all about you and it's me in you. You're living apart from the one and most important component, me in you. So the cross is saying, I love you guys. Forgive them, Father. They don't know what they're doing, but we know them from the beginning. There's so much more. They're worth this. Nobody ever taught me that. They just said it was all about my sin, and it left me a sinner, and I kept sinning. And by the time I'm 20, I don't go to church. That's my fault. It's nobody else's, but I was never told this gospel. I was told, pray, receive him in your heart, and make sure you go to church because he's coming. And the whole goal was to get me to heaven someday. And his goal was to get heaven into you. We made it all about heaven someday. He said the kingdom of God's here. The kingdom of God's here. It's here. Where is it? It's in me. And now is not the day to have an attitude contrary to truth and love. Now is not the day to just fight to be right. Now is not the day to be nitpicky and animosity. Now is the day to pursue being like Him. And to lay it all down and walk in love so He might be glorified through us. Now is not the day to just have a Christian confession and life in the flesh. Now is the day to have life in the Spirit. Yeah? I'm telling you, man. Man. People say, you can't live that way. You're wrong. Stop believing your flesh and allowing tomorrow to be yesterday, day after day after day. Jesus said, walk in the light as he's in the light. He said, if any man says he abides in him, he ought to walk even as he walked. He said, the things I do, you'll do if you believe. He's the firstborn among many, brethren. He's predestined us to be conformed to the image of His Son. And who He predestined, He called. And who He called, He justified. And who He justified, He glorified. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who can even bring a charge against God's elect? Why? He, he, if He didn't spare His own Son on the cross, but freely delivered Him up for us, how shall He not give us all things through that same Son? Who can even bring a charge against us because it's God who justifies? Who is he who condemns? Furthermore, it's Christ who was crucified on that cross and rose from the dead. Come on, that's powerful. And we turn it, if we're not careful, into a self-serving message that gives me something instead of makes me something. And then you have discouraged people that go to church. It's totally unscriptural. We actually think it's normal to be discouraged. Because we haven't realized discouragement is hinged on self-focus. Come on. The easiest, ooh, that's, that needs to settle in this room a little. Don't you deceive yourself and think that just discouragement is just normal. 
See, that's the thing I'm trying to teach right now. Those emotions come from a self-centered foundation. Be real with me. If you're discouraged, where's your focus? On how whatever you're pursuing is affecting you, inconvenient towards you, isn't working like you hoped, expected, or wanted. But see, here's the thing. God's not discouraged. He's the God of all hope. Why? He's selfless. He's not thinking for himself. He's thinking for others always. So you say, well, I'm discouraged in ministry because I stepped out, had this vision, and launched it, and it never happened. Yeah, and it was all about you, and you're finding your identity through ministry. That's why you're discouraged. You can still walk in the light. You can still walk in love. You can still walk in the kingdom and in power. Right. Yeah? yeah? Come on. I'm telling you what, guys, if we don't talk about this stuff and stay on it at the risk of offending a few, I'm telling you, I'm not trying to offend nobody and I'm not being insensitive. It's not scriptural to walk around discouraged. It's a self-focused lie and trap. Watch this. Jesus said, if any man come after me, let him first pray a prayer and assure his names in the book of life. If any man come after me, let him first what? Deny himself. Right there takes care of the problem. <laughs> Do you ever notice how we in the church are full of rights because we don't realize we inherited them through Adam when we thought for ourselves? Well, they should have never. Well, how do you expect me to feel? Well, if they'd have did that to you, you're telling me you wouldn't hurt. Well, you shouldn't even be talking to me. You should be talking to them. Well, I did. Well, they shouldn't have. Well, he said. That's among us. We're talking about miracles and raising the dead, and we can't get past attitudes that are... I don't know what you wanted me to preach, <laughs> but it's what's coming out. Come on. Who taught us that language? You, did you ever hear Jesus talk that way? See, somehow we got the idea this gospel's here to serve us. And make sure our day goes better and our needs are met and our families are protected. So if one of those things gets out of place, we're shaken to the core. We lose our disposition. We have an established relationship. He's our bus boy. He's our servant. And all of a sudden we have a quandary in question instead of revelation, integrity, and influence. Are you guys okay? Come on! If all this gospel does is serve us, we're only doing as good as it's going. And yet he's amazing and he's Lord. We ought to be doing as good as he is in us. Look, he's in you so you can shine. I'm not allowed to go past this carpet. That's why I'm... You see how disciplined I am? I want to come after you. And I, you know. <laughs> Come on, you're called to shine. I've said it for 20 years at least. 20 years at least. I've said this. You squeeze an orange, you expect orange juice. If it was apple juice, that's weird. Why isn't it weird if you squeeze a Christian and get everything but Christ? That should be weird. And wonder if the devils learn, I'll just squeeze them and prove they don't really know who they are and why they are. And now just prove that it's really all about them and their blessing and their day. <laughs> and all of a sudden you plaster faith scriptures all over your fridge. And you're quoting them and all they do is benefit your circumstances. And then at the end of the day when half of them or more don't come to pass, you wonder what's wrong with my faith? What am I doing wrong? And why isn't God answering? And you turn faith into all about blessing you and make your day convenient instead of shining and influencing the world with the beauty of who he is. So then when things don't work out, you get discouraged, your disposition drops and light gets canceled. And then nobody even knows that you're a Christian because you're bothered by the world like they are. That's how deceptive that thing is. Just one little wrong belief, one little motive twisted. Stop this thing from flowing. It's the little foxes that come in and spoil the precious fruit that wants to grow and bear on the vine or the branch. Yeah? Come on, guys. He thinks a whole lot of you and me. He shed his blood to live inside us. To wash us clean and make us pure before him. Don't you let anybody talk you out of this. If you're sincere about wanting forgiveness and you're sincere about wishing you did things different, 
I'm telling you, the blood of Jesus will wash you and cleanse you and make you holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight, if indeed you keep believing. Yeah? You say, yeah, but I messed up right after that. Yeah, and you felt terrible and cried yourself to sleep. Yeah? That means you're sincere and you're changing and you're growing. You ought to thank God for the truth that's working in your life. Yeah? Make sure your identity wraps around what he did, not what you did. Because if you keep your identity wrapped around what he did, what you did is about to change. Because if you can make the tree good, the fruit's good. If you try to change the fruit, you're always a failure. Making the tree good has to do with changing your identity and letting the gospel identify you for who you are. Come on, there's no apple tree on the planet that ever popped an apple out on the branch to prove to you it was an apple tree. It produces an apple because it is an apple tree. So you make a tree good. You tell people who they are, who they've become, and what's possible. And we're supposed to go, yeah, because the blood of Jesus and the cross says so. Like, why would he come? Do you think he really came because we're sinners? Or do you think he came because we're lost sons and daughters? Come on, you don't pay such a crazy price for a bunch of sinners. You're redeeming something. You guys know this. If you write a big check, whatever you wrote it for, you believe the purchase possession is well worth the price or you wouldn't have paid. In fact, we're bargain hunters. We're usually writing it because we think it's well worth the price. We know the car's worth 12.5 and we're still offering him 11.2. Come on! It's Mark 12, 5, man! You ain't saying, I'll tell you what, I'll give you 13. Not necessary, man, it's Mark 12, 5. I know, but I'll give you 13. It doesn't happen, right, car salesman? No, it doesn't happen! You put the price on there even when you're sincere, we're still trying to knock you down. It's the bigger thing. I'll give you 10-2. I got a 12-5. I can't give it for 10-2. I got more than that in it. 10-2, man. Uh, I'll go 11-7. Uh, 10-6. Uh, 11-3. It, come on, man. Guess what God does? Blood of my son. To redeem you. So the blood of the Son speaks of your value, because how do you put a value on the blood of Jesus? He's willing to pay the blood of His Son to redeem and restore our lives. So if you were the enemy, wouldn't you try to mix up, tone down, or taint what it was all about? And wouldn't you just make it about our eternal security, or blessing, or full vats and barns? Instead of Christ-likeness and transformation and becoming like Him and following Him and walking in love. Yeah? Come on. Because that's what He paid for. He paid for you and my transformation. He paid for you and me to become what He originally created. And that language that we learned to talk our whole lives, He never taught us. I say it all the time, if you listen to me, it's not redundant, it's the truth. We were homeschooled in the wrong home. We were taught by lies our whole life. There was a self-centered twist to all our wisdom. There's a rightness, a victim, villain, he said, she said, tit for tat mentality from the time you can remember. Come on, guys, you were angry before you could speak a language. Your mom took your little cup and you weren't done with it. Sweetest little thing. We got pictures all over the wall of you. You are precious. Everybody, ooh, ah. But you take that cup when you're not ready to give it up. You're turning colors. <laughs> ah, my cup. You can't even say my cup, but you're saying my cup. <laughs> ah! You take a binky when a baby ain't done with it. They can't even speak, but they'll let you know. They ain't happy. <laughs> Two little kids playing with a toy. Side by side, just playing. Mom's talking over tea. Jesus. <laughs> I'm 
I'm serious. Some of you ladies are like that. <laughs> Sweetest things on the planet, man. You wouldn't even raise your voice at your kids. You are pampering them and you are nurturing them in the presence of the Lord. And I'm being serious. But they're still going to need born again. You be a good model. Don't get discouraged and think you're failing. But there's this tendency called the fall of man that you'll see. You're just the sweetest thing. You're so, you're so into Jesus. You love him and your friend loves him and your little kids are playing and it's just so beautiful and you're like, oh, look at that. And all of a sudden, the one sees this toy, lays this toy down, and this other one doesn't even care about that toy until that one touches it. And then it's on. And then he drops the toy he had, and now they both got the same toy. And then moms are like, Trying to cast out devils. Where did we go wrong? <laughs> Fail your mothers. <laughs> I'm just telling you. There's a lady in our church came to me years ago and said, where am I failing as a mother? I said, you're not failing. You're probably the most incredible mother on the planet. Yeah, right. My daughter's manifesting. I said, what? She's going, eh, eh, eh. I said, you, what, do you think you need to cast a devil out of her? She said, she's, I've never taught her that. I said, you don't have to. It's just there. I said, honey, your little daughter's going to need Jesus. She needs born again. So don't get discouraged and think you're failing. Keep modeling Jesus. And as she gets a little older, she's going to realize there's something in you that she doesn't see in her. And you might get to tell her about it right at bedtime. And you might be able to give her what's in you. Yeah? Wouldn't that be awesome? Like your little six or seven year old sincerely says, Mommy, what's so different about you? What do you mean, honey? Well, I just know I'm this and this and this. And she has a conviction at a young age because of your life. That sure beats frustration, believing you're failing, condemnation, striving, Shaba, casting out devils that aren't there most of the time. <laughs> I'm just saying. Guys, if we could just get something simple tonight. There's a way that seemeth right to a man, but it's way there and leads unto death or destruction. Depends what translation you read. Death and destruction is pretty nasty. It doesn't sound like a good resume. There's a way that what? Now see, that's the problem, isn't it? Because it seems right. If you don't know him and grow close to him, and let that condemnation and shame from yesterday fall off and just... Receive his love and start getting close to him and fill your heart with the truth. See, you don't read your Bible because it's the Christian thing to do. You read your Bible to know him. Once you get deceived and get into works, well, you know, I just don't read my Bible until I feel grace on it because I don't want God, I don't want to just read it because I don't. <laughs> just change your motive, just tweak it. You're not reading your Bible to pass. You're not reading your Bible in case one of your leaders say, where have you been feeding at, brother? Nowhere. <laughs> or you got to lie, you know, oh, I read. <laughs> Don't lie. People live like they're under pressure, like, well, you know, I haven't read my Bible for a while. I probably should pick it up. No, just, just leave it lay till you get a right motive because that, you're just feeding a lie. You say, no, open it, and maybe God will meet you. Well, he hadn't met you up until now doing that. I would probably say, lay it back down, get a right motive. I'm not afraid to tell you that. Don't read your Bible because you're supposed to. Read your Bible to know him because you're developing a relationship with Jesus. And when you open that Bible, talk to Holy Spirit and thank him he's in your life. Don't think because you haven't felt him for a while, he left you. You know, that's why people go up to the altar for touches. Because they're looking for reaffirmation because they haven't been living close to him. So they go look to get touched by God to go, whew. That's called living a million miles away from him. It's not healthy and it's not good. He'll never leave you or forsake you. He loves you. He'll never change his mind about you. 
and his blood speaking better things over your life. So it's time for you to get the veil off your face and say, you know what, I'm coming right at you and I ain't backing off. You love me, you've changed me, you're changing me. You'll never leave me. While I was yet a sinner, you came. You sure ain't leaving me now. You're going to walk me through this and you're going to take weakness out of my life and make me strong. And God, you're going to fix every broken thing. You're going to make me more like you because I want to know you more. And then you open your Bible, Holy Spirit, I know you love me and you're going to reveal the Father to me, the Son to me, and who you are in my life, and you're going to show me who I am in you, I'm going to find you in this book. I want to know you more. And you read your Bible to know him, not to pass a Christian grade. Yeah? Is this important? Can you imagine sitting all alone just reading your Bible? I'm talking, I'm not mad at technology, but don't let it be a stronghold in your life. Turn that thing off for a while. If you can't turn it off for a while, you just told yourself you got a problem. Don't let it be a false lifeline, a false sense of connectivity. If you can't turn that thing off for a while, that's, that's the problem. If you got to check it while you're going 70 down the highway, just because it beat. And you got two car seats filled in your car. And that little beep, and you got to check it going 70 in traffic. That's the problem. And then you look down, and all it is is a picture of their food. Wish you were here. <laughs> yeah, that was worth your life risk. And now you're taking a picture of your dash. Me too, dude. I'm on route, whatever. <laughs> Come on, man. That's what people are doing all the time. And I don't get it, and I don't want to. <laughs> I'm just saying, turn all that stuff off for a minute. You get alone with him, and you read the word for the right reasons, and you talk to him from your heart. You're one of two things in that moment. You're either out of your mind, you need to get a hobby, or he's real, and you're going to get to know him. Yeah? It's just important, guys, and I promise you, I'm telling everybody in this room, so everybody on the planet fits this, but everybody in this room fits it. You all have that right and you all have that access. And I'm being real honest and raw when I say this. You're the only one that can keep you from that place because he's there waiting. You're the only one. While you were yet a sinner, he came and set it straight. I'll guarantee you he's wooing you to that place now. <laughs> Come on. While you were yet a sinner, he came and made it straight. Don't think he ain't waiting for you in that secret place. He says, if you do what you do in front of men and only with men, you have your reward in full already. Now, I don't think we do it intentionally to be seen by men a lot of times. I think we just have more of a confidence in the corporate setting. Everybody's singing, the music's right, and man, it's like you'll sing it out. But if that's the only time you do that, that's, that's the reward you'll get. That's the highest thing you can receive, whatever you get in that atmosphere. But when you... When you pray, when you seek Him, when you worship, you can put all those things in there. It wouldn't twist Scripture. You go do it in the secret. He who is in secret will see you there. Yeah? What would it look like if you wake up in the morning, instead of pray about blessing or pray for your boss to treat you a little better or just pray that you feel a little more motivated in your body? I wonder if you'd just wake up and actually believe your life is so worth living in God. You are so looking at me in righteousness and you've cleaned me, you've made me whole, you've washed me clean, you've empowered me. God, you've made me your own and you've put all that you are inside of me. Man, my days of complaining are over. I'm done just praying for a better day. I'm going to live a Jesus day. And no matter what mood my boss is in, I'm going to shine. I'm going to do my job under you. And God, people are going to know something's going on in me without me trying so hard. My light is going to shine. wonder if you'd put that on. I wonder if you'd put that kind of attitude on. Stop praying for a new job because you can't stand the one you have. <laughs> and then until you get the new one, you're not happy at the one you have. So nobody really knows you're a Christian. <laughs> until you come here and they see you and they go, oh, you're a Christian? That's not good. Like, that's not good. Like, if you're the only one that knows you're a Christian, there's probably something not quite right. When I got saved, 11 guys that I worked with came out of the woodwork. And I'm not saying this to judge them or be, I just, it's just funny to me because I was young in the Lord. And I just thought, you come into something like this, you just think that's what people experience. And 
So you think every Christian in that moment is going through what you're going through. You, you learn quick they're not. But 11 guys came out of the woodwork and saw my life and got so convicted they confessed they were Christians and that they all went to church. And it shocked me. There is no way I could even picture any of them in church. <laughs> but thank God, the truth brought them out of the closet. The conviction, they might just be your life changed away from stepping into a brighter light. They might just be your life changed away from stepping in. They might just need to see an example bright, and it just might be you. Yeah? And now you're evangelizing and you're not even trying, you're just being real. You're sowing seed and watering and you're not even trying. I think that's the way it's supposed to be. Not, oh, I got to go win my city. <laughs> I think it'd be better if Jesus would win us. If Jesus really wins us, we'll probably win our cities. If you live changed, you'll sow change into your city. If you live transformed, if you become love, you'll love people. You won't try to love people, you'll love people. You guys with me? I'm just throwing some stuff out there that's possible that we're called to. I just, I'm not even sure where we're at right now. I'm just, I'm just throwing some little thoughts out there. Let me go back to something. Don't let this sound too basic. He really did come and he put himself in a woman and he was born of a virgin. I mean, he was born as a baby. He didn't pop in the wilderness at age 30 ready for ministry. Like, where did you come from? I came from above. <laughs> he, he told them he came from above, but they knew he came out of Mary. And they went, well, you're Mary's boy. What do you mean you came from the Father? We, we saw you grow up in Mary's house. We know your brothers. We know your family. You're cuckoo, man. You didn't come from above. But he did, didn't he? Whew. It's so powerful to me. Like, he knows he's going to die. He knows men are going to mistreat him. And he stays the same. He heals people and they're trying to figure out what devil was behind the healing. And he keeps on healing. He multiplies their food and he says to them, you only come back to me because of the food yesterday. And then he preaches on discipleship and what it means to eat his flesh and drink his blood or what it means to really surrender. And they're like, whew, this is too much. And they all bold it. They're like, hey, feed us, we'll hang around you. Talk like that, we're out of here, bud. He knows how men are. And love never failed. He went to the cross. Come on, man, the mentality we were trained by, it wasn't Jesus. We ain't going no extra mile. Some of us haven't even gone a foot. We're waiting for somebody else to go a foot. I'm just saying. We haven't given up much. Some of us are like, you do me wrong, you'll pay. Is that what we were trained by? Well, you started it. Well, you should have never. Well, hey, but... yeah? Come on, that's Jesus with the cross. What am I doing? This is stupid. Man, nobody loves me, they don't care. I'm doing nothing but good. And they would have beat me and smacked me around. No, what am I thinking? Did anybody ever read scripture where Jesus second guessed and had a spaz moment like that? <laughs> Kids, the best. See how no self consciousness in a child, man. Learn from kids. Ugh. Now, don't just run all over the place, but learn <laughs> from kids because they can get away with it. They're kids, and they do it totally innocent. When I pastored a church, I didn't have no children's church. I had the kids sit with us. They were coloring in the aisles and talking. I would be in the middle of preaching, and one would just run up and hug my leg, lay their head against my leg, hug my leg, and run back and start coloring. Right in the middle of preaching, I'm like, yeah, bless you. Or they'd just come over and go like this. I'll pick them up while I'm preaching. And just put them back down, and they just run. Come on, if you can't handle that, That would concern me. We sing, Jesus loves a little. Okay, what about you? <laughs> Come on, man. You're... 
get around, get on an airplane. I was just on an airplane. Them kids were going crazy on that flight coming here. People don't handle that well. They're like, I paid $400 to listen to kids cry. That's what people, that's what adults think. And the parents are under crazy pressure to keep their kids quiet because everybody's bickering. And then we forget that we were kids and that they're just kids. We get so thin-skinned that we think a child can't make a noise on an airplane because you paid for a seat. You see what happened? When Adam ate that tree, it got nasty. <laughs> Please don't bring Jesus into that. It doesn't work. It's not Jesus Incorporated. It's Christ in me, the hope of glory. You're not the CEO of Jesus Incorporated. <laughs> There's no such company. You die. It's the only option. Die. I'm serious. It's time to die, all of us. Die what? Die to ourselves. Die to human rights and all that stuff. I'm concerned. I, I know I'm going to get in trouble for this. You guys record things and stuff. But I'm concerned that if something breaks out in America and persecution and stuff, that the best we'll know how to do is pick it and protest. I'm concerned that we'll be professional picketers and protesters and pick it for our Christian rights. What about love your enemy? What about pray for those who persecute you? What about give to those who spitefully use you? You say, well, that's passive, and that's a pushover, and you're a doormat. Jesus was not a doormat. He's the living epistle of love, and he's my hero, and he lives in me, and he wants me to be like him. He didn't say eye for eye and tooth for tooth. He said, turn the other cheek. He said, it's the goodness of God that lead men to repentance. And if you give your enemy a cup of cold water when they're thirsty, you'll heap hot coals upon their head. Yeah? There was this village like 20 years ago that had their a little 15-year-old martyred in their village, and the, the, the government got a hold of what happened, and they said, this is beyond, beyond. This is a child, a minor. And they quarantined the village that murdered the, he, They martyred him. They killed him in front of a bunch of Christian kids. Killed him, picked on a 15-year-old, and he stood and looked him in the eyes and wouldn't renounce Christ. He chopped his arms off one at a time. And he stood there and didn't change his mind. Fifteen years old. Whew. American mentality, that story makes us mad. Well, now, see, that's what I get so mad about God. Like, why would he just sit there and let that 15? And God just, and I don't know why he would. And I, your attitude's giving you away, and now you're rambling, and you're finding fault with him, and you're wise in your own opinion, and you're quick to anger and quick to speak and slow to listen, and that's the opposite. The Bible says you should be. You ought to be concerned. You go back and try to change that boy's mind now that he took a stand. You go into eternity and fetch him and try to take his legacy from him. Fifteen years old didn't know how to be afraid and be a coward. Fifteen years old and already didn't know how to love his own life unto death. Got an arm laying in the sand. You think that would change a 15-year-old's mind? Now he's got another one laying in the sand. Blood spewing and he's bleeding to death. He falls on his knees and he's running out of blood. And they're mocking him and they take the machete across his belly. True story written out by the youth worker that witnessed the whole thing. And all his insides fell onto the ground. And they said, you fool, you give your life for a God that won't save you. See, they're taught, they, they are so deceived. They think it's all about self. He already did save him. His God already did save him. He saved him from himself. They're trying to get him to pick up himself. See, they're picking on the wrong one. They're cutting his body up. He's a dead boy. He already gave up himself. You can't hurt him by cutting him to him. 15 years old and he had that revelation. Don't tell me we can't. You better not get spoiled in this country. You better not get mad at God. But why didn't God? You stop that. I'll say that with a smile, but man, I'm serious. You stop that. That mad at God. Well, me and God ain't talking right now. We're working through. So that is ludicrous. Stop it. 
You're not talking. You're deceived. You're moody. You have an attitude. You don't have a relationship. It's one-sided. He told us to love him like he loves us, and he uses the word agape. He's saying, you love God like God loves you. See, God loves you, period. He believes the best. He sees you for your potential. You ought to believe the best about God even when you don't understand. You ought to believe he's good just because he sent his son. Because if you cop an attitude that's detrimental and destructive to your emotions and your words or speaking stuff, come on, that's a dead giveaway. You're not speaking truth. Come on, somebody in here needs to hear that. There's a handful of people. There's eight, ten people that could benefit from what, what I'm on right now. And it's not comfortable when we ever talk about this stuff. I don't ever plan to. But I'm telling you, there's some quick lips that God wants to... You're not producing life with your words. That's a dead giveaway. You're not speaking by the Spirit. Are you guys with me? Come on, man. Don't get caught in that rational world. Don't get caught in that way that seemeth right. Don't build a court case against God. Subpoena Him and try Him and judge Him. Come on. Let's, let's lay down our lives. Let's die already. The government banned that village from buying, selling, trading. They literally quarantined them from human contact. They, 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 they blocked them off. You guys follow me? And it's, it's crazy how it is in other countries. They, they blocked them off from, so they kind of trapped them to die like rats in the jungle because they wouldn't have the strength of others, the ability to go buy, and so they would have had to provide for their own, and they couldn't do that. And that was their penalty. And the pastor of the village of the boy that got martyred said, we can't let these men die like rats in the jungle. They have destinies. They're loved by God. The men that killed the boy. You know what a lot of pastors would get tricked into doing and the people of the church? Well, that's God's judgment. Now they're going to get what's coming to them. And as you judge, you're judged with. And all of a sudden, you have enough scripture to think you could send somebody to hell. <laughs> no, the pastor said, let's get them food. Let's get them supplies. Let's get some things in there to them and tell them that we love them and we're praying for them. And it's so broken because they were the ones that killed the boy. It heaped coals upon their head. It got their hearts so ripped. They said, why would you do this to us? They said, because you're blind, you're deceived. And Jesus said one thing that trained us. Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. And that's all we know what to believe. That if you had a true revelation, you wouldn't live the way you're living and do what you're doing. And we hurt for you. We're not mad at you. We cry for you. We're not frustrated at you. Because you're blind. And if God could open your eyes, your whole lives would change. You would never do something like that again. We forgive you. You're more than what you did. And it broke, the, broke these men and they all got changed. Isn't that beautiful? Boy, that sure beats some of the, you know, you got to be careful. You shift over on the Old Testament. You start reading the Old Testament when your heart's troubled. That's scary. The Old Testament's life apart from covenant. It's life apart from the revelation of Jesus. You're in a new covenant, New Testament. Don't you turn and start reading David's Psalms, cut them down, bring them to their knees, and <laughs> kill them before my eyes, God. <laughs> Be careful that law and sin and death thing. You're not under that anymore. You're under the law of the spirit of life that flows through Christ. He said, you say, you say. Jesus said this, you say, meaning me and you. You say. Love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say, love your enemy. What's Jesus doing? Changing our language. You say, a man shall not murder, but I say, if you hate, you already have murder. What's he doing? Changing our language. What's he saying? You ain't saying what I'm saying because you weren't taught by me. Let no man on earth be your teacher. You have one teacher. He's the Christ. So once Jesus comes, he changes everything. and You find your truth through him, your identity through him, and your life through him. Not just your blessing. You guys okay? This ain't too stern, right? I'm smiling the whole time. I'm trying to be nice because I feel happy in my heart. I, the reason I talk this way is because we're called to this. We're called to this. He paid for us to live this way. And guys, we don't want to live any other way because there's not life or productivity in any other way. There's, is, he's not a way, he's the way. 
So if we hook up to him, we're in the way. This is that that's this is simple. Like he's the way. Yeah. He's that's how I feel. He's the truth. Right? He's not a truth. He's far from a good idea. He's the truth. We grew up with some truth, but a lot of it was half truth. Half truth is dangerous and destructive because it's just enough truth that you can't identify that it's not all truth. And then it doesn't produce freedom. It's half true. It's worse than just total deception. I'd rather, Jesus said, I'd rather you be hot or cold than lukewarm. Lukewarm is in the middle of hot and cold. It's sometimes not even detectable. You're in the right places for the wrong reasons, doing the right thing without the... Yeah? Clouds without water, spots in a love feast. You're at the love feast, but you ain't got nothing to add to it. That's tough. Jesus talks about this kind of stuff a lot. He says, unless you and me love less our mother, father, they're important folks. Your spouse, pretty important. Your children, they're up there. Your houses, your lands, and yes, right? Your children, your houses, your lands, and yes, even your own life. Unless you love less this list that's dear to you, you'll by no means be my disciple. The word disciple means a wholehearted follower, a disciplined learner. Here's what he's saying. Unless you put your life in priority and realize why you're here. You're not here for me to protect all those things dear to you. You're here for me to shine through you into all those things. And if you don't see that, you'll let one of those things get in the way and you'll never walk out what you're here for. And you'll make it all about me taking care of that list instead of you shining into it. Well, that's good preaching right there. I'll take that. Come on. Unless you love life. So you can't be a Christian for you. You have to be a Christian for his great name and others. If you're a Christian for your sake, like just for your well-being or provision, you've got the wrong understanding of why you're a Christian and you're going to live your life up and down and you're going to have your highs and lows and that's not Christianity. This is not the gospel. Up and down is not the gospel. People preach Mountain Valley theology. It's like, well, that's whack theology. Well, you know, brother. No, the day of the righteous grows brighter and brighter. We're increasing from faith to faith and glory to glory. We're getting the knowledge of the Son of God. And we're not tossed to and fro by wind and doctrine. We're getting a revelation of who he is growing in the fullness of him to the full measure of the stature of Christ. It's Ephesians 4. It's why we have meetings like this. To cheer people on in who they are and who they've become through him. So we can take accountability and stewardship for our own lives, not somebody else's. And become what he paid for us to become. You don't listen to a sermon like this for your neighbor, your spouse, or your child, or your parent. Say, I hope they're listening. No, that, that means I'm talking to you. You're distracted. You're letting where they're not decide where you are. You're letting their life influence you in a bad way. Come on. We let what we're going through decide who we are. We let what people are doing decide who we are if we're not careful. And all of a sudden, life is speaking louder than truth, but truth makes you free. And all of a sudden, I'm only as good as it's going instead of as good as he is in me. Come on, man. Every one of us can live by faith. Every one of us can hear what the Spirit of the Lord is crying out. And say, you know what? Apart from any other factor in my life, I can live this thing. And you can squeeze me and Jesus will come out. Because I'm going to be with him and understand why he's in me and why he came. Man, he didn't come for me to have a better day. He came for me to have a transformed day and have a day in him. And look like him. That's why he came. He didn't come to bless me. He came to transform me. Yeah. Yeah. His nature is going to bless me, but the intention of him coming was new life, born again. You can't bring the old mentality into something new. You cannot be a Christian for you. You can't be like, well, yeah, but, yeah, but nothing. Stop it. Stop it. You, Jesus didn't teach you that language. 
The Last Supper. We call it the Last Supper. He's breaking the bread. He's got the cup. He says, this is my body. He, he's not a hurting minister. I can't believe I poured myself into you for how many years now and you saw countless miracles and they're going to strike me tonight and you're all going to scatter and you all say you're going to die for me, you bunch of liars. I mean, if I can't trust you, who can I trust? I mean, we have had intimate times together. At least I thought John gets her head off of me. <laughs> Come on! And all of a sudden, it's what we can get out of it instead of what we can become. And all of a sudden, you actually have pastors that believe it's okay to be hurt and offended. It's not scriptural to be hurt and offended. It says if you are perfected in love and walk in love, you have no cause for stumbling because of your brother. In other words, there's nothing about your brother's life that can cause you for stumbling from truth because the truth is found in him, not your brother. Come on, this thing is scriptural. It says in 1 John 2, if any man says he abides in him, he ought to walk even as he walked. He said, as the Father sent me, so I send you. How did he send him? We think power and miracles. No, for God so loved. He says, man, if you forgive them, they'll know forgiveness and they'll be forgiven. If you don't forgive them, how will they know? They'll stay unforgiven. You are the body of Christ. You go love them the way I've loved you and they'll know the way to me through your love. It's so simple. Listen, I'm not crying this stuff out to spank you or correct you. I came here to tell you who you are. You're already excited and fired up. Let's just sharpen in truth. Let's just stay steadfast. Let's stay consistent. And let's walk this thing out. Right? That's all I'm saying. Jesus paid for it. He must believe it's possible. You're the roster of heaven right here. You're the best he's got. And he's okay with that. You're the, you're the best he's got. He's not looking at a new class and... Draft picks and <laughs> trades. He paid for you. He signed for you a long time ago, like before the foundation of the world. Yeah? And it's the goodness of God, not the reprimand of God. It's the goodness of God that leads men to change. So what's God saying? You're worth this. You were made for this. And I know it. And I never changed my mind. And I paid for it. Come on, if you're a pastor or you're in ministry or you're a Bible teacher, you be careful you're not finding your identity through what you do for Him instead of who you are in Him and what people say about you and how they see you. It's a trap. That's how pastors get hurt. They feel, they get rational. They say, well, I'm laying down my life for these people and they don't appreciate it. It started happening to me. I was only pastoring for probably six, eight months. And it was back in 98. And it's when you learn this stuff, man. I go to the altar one night and Sunday night and I was... I was uh, I was uh, just praising God, and I was up there. I was just going to thank Him about my life and saving me. It all felt good. I knelt down, and He said, why, why would you be found discouraged if I'm the God of all hope? And I'm like, discouraged? And all of a sudden, it hit me. I was discouraged with the people I was pastoring. I was starting to let it get to me. I was starting to think that they were spoiled. They didn't appreciate righteousness. They didn't appreciate the shed blood. They just wanted God to bless them and not change them. And I might have been right, but I was letting it harden my heart. So I, I cried, and it seemed like God got his word across to me. But it was probably a month or two later, I'm in my bedroom kneeling down, and I'm praying to go to the mission field. I'm asking God to give me a nation. It sounded so spiritual. God, give me a nation. Ooh. And there, who knows God can give you a nation. But man, if you were listening, you thought, that Dan, he is just so surrendered. Look, he's just so spiritual. I'm like, give me a nation. I don't care where it is. Third world country. I don't care about the food, the water. God, I have covenant. You'll get me through. Put it in the heart of my family. Let's go, God. I'll lay down my life for the hungry. See, that's the giveaway. I'll lay down my life for the hungry. What about the people that don't seem hungry? Will you still shine the same? So after I'm done my great prayer... The Lord, I'm kneeling and I'm passionately praying. The Lord said, and it was, a, it was an amazing moment because he, I don't know how the Lord's ever talked to you, but sometimes he talks to me with emotion, with tone, with expression. I just hear him that way. And it was just one of them times like, he said, so you'll lay your life down for the hungry. It was a question. 
And I just knew I was going to be fathered. And I was like, <laughs> oops. And it's a good oops, because he loves me. He's good. We're going to come out good. He said, so you'll lay your life down for the hungry. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> he said, Dan, my son laid his life down for those who despise and reject him. He said, you get your heart in that place, and we'll talk about it. And I didn't totally get it. I just began to cry, because I knew he was fathering me. I just began to cry, and in my heart I was like, Lord, I don't totally get what you're saying and how you're correcting me, but I know you are. You're fathering me. I'm open to be fathered. And he said, Dan, your discouragement and your belief towards the people you're pastoring is causing frustration and discouragement. Discouragement is birthing desire to run from what you're frustrated with and put you on the mission field. It's not my spirit putting the desire for the mission field. It's discouragement. He said, everything is out to reproduce itself. Everything wants to pass its gene. Discouragement has reproduction. People have unresolve in their marriage. They have needs in their life. They aren't walking in the fulfillment of Jesus' love. They're actually needing a significant other. When that's not working out, they get hurt. Unresolved conflict, unfailed or failed expectations unfulfilled desire. Next thing you know, they look in another direction through unfulfillment, hurt, and pain, and they think everything about what they see over here is perfect because it's going to meet what this isn't. Everything like that births something. It's not good. It's fantasy. It can never be love. It's pain that's making you... If you were healthy here, you wouldn't even see it. But because you're hurt... You need, and now you see it, and this seems like Mr. or Mrs. Right. And next thing you know, you have Christian people with unresolved in their marriages getting their hearts attached to significant others. Why? It's needs-based, needs-driven, it's unfulfilled, and it's a sign that we don't know Jesus like we sing. It's not normal. It's a total lie. It can never be love. It's a Hollywood starry-eyed fantasy, and it brings more pain in the long run. My discouragement and frustration was birthing a desire called mission field. And here's what the Lord said. He said, the problem is, Dan, if I don't show you this and you go to the mission field, I honor my word and I love people. And you'll preach my word because you have my word, but your motive's wrong. You're only there because you're discouraged here. Now, who knows God calls people to the mission field? But who knows, a lot of people start works because they're mad at their church, didn't fit in, tried to use another ministry as a platform to manifest, said they're controlling me and won't turn me loose. I'll start my own thing. Dangerous. So there's a lot of pain out there that's starting things. There's a lot of egos that have been slapped starting things. Now, I'm not saying that's you. You know if it's you when I'm talking. You know the why behind your life, friend. And when God exposed it, there was no hiding it. I bawled like a baby. And here's what he told me. He said, the, the paradox is, I'll be honor my word and I'll move and I'll flow and I'll do things because of their hunger and my word. And he said, but every time I move, you'll look over your shoulder at what you disdain and say, see, and you'll compare the move of God to them. And you'll say, see, God couldn't do that there because they're this and this and this. And next thing you know, your heart becomes harder and harder and harder. And now you have a resume on the mission field, souls won miracles, and your heart's even more convinced and more hard towards what you left because you were mad. And now you've judged them through what I've done for you here. He said, and it would be at the cost of your own heart. Ain't that something? And I laid there and cried, and I said, what would happen if you didn't father me? I'd get to see and let some other motive drive me into what I think is you. You see how important it is to be the steward of your own heart because out of your heart flows the issues of life? You can't afford to believe it's normal to just live hurt and offended and angry and frustrated. They're all lies. None of those things is what God made us to be. That's what we became when Adam ate that tree and lived separate from God. Do you understand that God made man in His image and God is love? Do you understand that? That God made man in His image. Now watch this. God made man in His image and in His own likeness. So God made man to love. When God, when God made man to love, God made man like Him. So when man ate that tree and separated himself from the source of love, he got cut off from love and became in need of love. So a minute ago, he was love. Now he's in need of love. 
And it says in Romans 5 that every man was born into Adam. And we must be born again. Somehow we turned that into prayer to benefit us and take us to heaven instead of transform us. So what's a Christian? Getting grafted back in and being restored back to love. Not just the love of the Father, becoming the love of the Father. The goal of our instruction is love. It's not, it doesn't stop with Jesus loves you. Oh. It starts with Jesus loves you. The goal is you becoming the love of Jesus. Above all things, put on love. It's the bond of perfection. It says love fulfills the law and does no harm to the neighbor. Love's why we're on the planet. If you're not a Christian to become love, you're not a Christian for why he came. It's straight. It's narrow. Narrow is the way. Confined is the way. Broad is the way to destruction. So you've got to settle, what are my beliefs producing? Where am I heading? And how have I been really doing? You've got to make sure you're on that narrow path of why you're in him and why he's in you. I say it all the time. Mercy woke you up today to give you one more day to be like him. That's why you're alive to love. You're alive to be found in His image. And if we let any other image decide who we are, we'll be deceived. He's the way, He's the truth, and He's the life. We say He's the way to heaven, and He said He's the way to the Father. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. So he's an invite back to the Father so everything the Father is can be alive and prevalent in you. So you can walk in the light as he's in the light. Guys, it's called born again. It's not a passport to heaven. It's not a reservation. It's a new life. It's a new way. It's a new mindset. It's a new reason for being. And if you'll really listen tonight and allow these things to begin to convict and touch your heart and where you actually actively act on them, it changes everything about your life, your marriage, your relationships, your friends. I promise you, don't get judged by this and don't elbow each other. It'll take the animosity out of your home. I'm not the brightest man on the planet, but I've learned a few things. It takes two to tango. It takes one to make peace. And you're just not going to pull me into that dance. I don't know how to dance anyway. You're not going to pull me into the tango. I have no rhythm. They say white man can't jump. Well, this white man can't do either, dance or jump. Actually, I can jump okay. I can't dance. <laughs> you're not going to bring me into that. There's nothing my wife can do to make me tango. It's, I'm just telling you, you don't have to believe me. I don't wake up for her to love me. And I don't wake up for her to treat me right. So she can't let me down. I wake up to be like him. And if you'll teach yourself through prayer to wake up to be like him, it changes everything. Do I have any other pastors or leaders or people that do counseling or have people come to them as a leader? Yeah? Anybody else? Got a handful? Okay. Who would agree with me that a lot of the counsel people have, it's people issues and what people said, how they feel, and what people did, and it's not fair, and it's people stuff. And it proves that we don't understand why he came. And somehow we think he came for my benefit instead of my change. See, nobody has to treat you right for you to be right in God, like okay in expression. I don't mean right and rightness. Nobody has to treat you right for you to live right in God. Because He already treated you right. Like my disposition is not contingent on your expression. Like I didn't wake up for you to do me right today. <laughs> so I'm probably not going to focus on the fact that you did me wrong. Because what's that mean? Squeeze an orange, orange juice. Squeeze a Christian, Christ. When that should be just simple. That's just simple 101 Christian. So 
So what did we accomplish tonight? Well, through this teaching, hopefully we were trained by a lie and the way we grew up being and thinking and feeling has nothing to do with him. So now that he came, we ought to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. And don't bring an alibi into our new life and say, yeah, but you don't know and talk the language that we talked before he came. If you bring the language that you talked before Christ was in you into your new life, you'll taint the expression of your new life. If you think for a second you become a victim and somebody's a villain, you're, you're out of bounds. You're not in the gospel. Because if that's true, we're villains and God is the biggest victim on the planet and He needs ministry. Yeah? Just be real. So I'm calling you this tonight, and I'm saying, guys, we can live. All these scriptures wouldn't call us to it if he wasn't ready to back it with his power, and with his nature, and with his love. I want to look at one scripture in the Bible. Somebody will say, you know, well, we'll make the meeting legal. At least he read out of his Bible. <laughs> People say that stuff sometimes. It's funny. If you listen, I quote about half of it. Most of it, I tell you where it's even at, but regardless. Second Peter. Second Peter chapter 1, if you have a Bible. If you don't, you can just listen along. I don't know if these guys are prepared, and I'll slap it up there for you, but when they first started doing that years ago, it was funny. I'm pretty naive, and I'm not a technical guy. So I was up on this platform preaching, and everybody's looking, and all of a sudden, they're all looking above me while I'm walking and talking, and they're all looking. I could tell they were, nobody was looking at me. They were looking right above me, and I thought... This guy had said in the service, he said, the whole time you were talking, there was this bright blue angel. And he was like going on. I'm like, really? Well, okay, cool. And I didn't think much of it. I was like, that's great. You saw that. I expect that stuff. I believe there's a spirit of revelation. So I wasn't that I was minimizing, but I didn't make a big fuss. I was like, cool. So when they were doing that, I thought, that angel must be up there again. <laughs> Everybody sees it. They're all looking. Like I'd walk and they're all looking up here. I turned, I thought, and it's the screen. They were reading the scriptures, and I'm a bummer. I thought, I thought it was the angel. They were just following along. I said, oh, well. Who knows? He might have been there anyway, huh? Second Peter chapter 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ. I like this. To those who, and we'll probably cover some of this this weekend, this is, this is a favorite topic of mine. It changed my life, this righteousness thing. To those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Where did our faith get obtained by? The way God sees us. The righteous judgment of God through Jesus. What He accomplished through Jesus to make you stand forgiven, complete, blameless, and above reproach. Holy and blameless above reproach. We see the way God sees us. He sees us for what He created us for, not where we've been. He sees us for what we're called to, not what we've done. And His love has the ability to separate you from the past, to give you the present and things to come. To say, you're so much more than what you've been. You're so much more than what you've believed. On your darkest day, he says, I know who I created you to be, and I know what's possible, and I paid a price to place you there. Faith springs out of the righteous understanding of the righteousness of God in Christ. He rules his kingdom with the scepter of what? Righteousness. So he dubs you righteous and knights you righteous and says, stand right in my sight. And you say, yeah, but Lord, you don't know what? I know what you... Oh, I'm off my carpet. You know what you've done. Sorry, I say... It's good they didn't hook up the shock collar, man. I'd have been done. Whew. Yeah. That would have gotten me. I was way out of bounds, man. See, I was jogging in Alabama. This is a good practical example of love. I'm jogging in Alabama. I'm just running down a side road. And I went about two and a half miles. I had two and a half more miles to go. And I was going to go up to a spot that I marked with the, the, the rental car. And then I was going to come back to the hotel. So it would have been five miles. So I had about another half mile that way. And then I'm coming the whole way back. So I would just do that because I'm in strange areas. So I would just try to get on a road that took me two and a half miles straight. Because you can't get lost. Turn around and come back. 
So I'm running, and this pit bull comes off the porch. He's a pit bull, and he's and he's coming to the curb. I'm saying, "Hey, buddy," I said, "Now you chill out." And I'm running along there, and I'm thinking he's a shock collar dog. I'm thinking he's going to get right about that far from the curb, and that's where they had those little stakes, and that's where his line is, and he knows right where to stop, right? So you're just cruising along there, and he's, rah, 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 rah. and I'm like, hey, buddy. And he's off the curb in a millisecond, has me by the back and side of the leg, and the two front canines go down in me so deep. And when he lets go, it looks like I'm bleeding to death. I got blood already in the road. You know how big their canines are, a pit bull's canines? I looked, and they were sticking to me. It looked like a magnum vampire <laughs> got me, man. And this lady come running out because she heard him barking. He's not supposed to be out. He's always trapped in the basement. She has no idea how he got out. But somehow he got out. And man, he got on my leg. People say, well, now see, you walk in covenant and righteousness and God. And how come and why and who and I and me. <laughs> Listen, the dog bit me. Be like Jesus. Well, I never saw scripture where Jesus got bit by a dog. <laughs> walk in love. Don't think for yourself. And watch God intervene. Don't make it about you. Make it about him and them. And find wisdom and grace. <laughs> so you look down, there's so much blood, your whole sock's red. I'm not kidding you. I never saw so much blood pour out of a human body. It was just, that thing went right into that main, whatever you got running back there, and it went right in it, and it was pouring out. And the lady goes, ah, she saw my legs. He bit you. I said, big smile. He did. He really bit me. And I said, but it's going to be okay. Everything's going to be fine. I'll explain in a minute. Why don't you grab me a towel? Could you get, get him in the house and get me a towel? And I start heading to the porch. And the husband comes out and he sees me and goes, well, he can't even talk. He don't know what to do. I promise you, he's thinking liabilities. My dog's getting killed today, euthanized. We got serious problems. We're paying out monies we don't have. This is not a good day. And I smiled and I said, hey, buddy. Everything's going to be fine. I already told your wife that. You'll understand in a minute. It's all good. It's all good. And she comes out with a towel. I'm bleeding profuse. It's pouring out of me. You have no idea. The whole side of my running shoe, you could touch it and blood's just in it, soaked in it. And I'm standing there, and I said, listen, the reason it's going to be good is Jesus. I said, he's my king. He's my everything. He's not my theology, the doctrine I live. He's, he's my reality. He's... We're in relationship. He's my king. He loves me a whole lot. And he loves me. And I'm just talking to him about Jesus and what I know and having him, right? So I throw my leg up on the side of their porch and I said, Thanks for that towel, ma'am. And I'm just smiling. I'm nice. They're not my enemies. Their dog got out. Boo boo. Shouldn't have happened, right? <clears throat> Shouldn't have done it, right? But he's out. He bit me. I get it. So why don't we find mercy, grow in wisdom, and move forward? Instead of, I can't believe your dog bit me and you caused me all kind of and wonder if my leg gets infected and you're going to pay and you should have known and why do you have a dog like that anyway? See, we talked about that in a minute, but not from the tone most people do. I think some people nowadays are wishing to get bit because they got so many rights. There's people out there advertising, if this ever happens to you, call. I'd rather you call on his name, not their name. So I wiped this towel over my leg. And as soon as I took it over, I was talking to him about the love of God and Jesus. And I told him I'm not mad at him. You got to understand I'm not mad at you guys. Listen, I said, but we're going to talk about something. And I wiped up over my leg. And when I wiped up over, no more blood came out. First rub with the towel, wiped the blood up. It's, there's no way that can happen. Them holes look like you took a heavy-duty nail punch and just shot them in the side of my leg. Them holes were as big around as my pinky in the side of my leg. And I wiped up over, and no more blood came out of them holes. 
And I laughed and I said, see? I said, that's my Jesus right there. I said, that's my Jesus. And they're like, and they still think they're in trouble, even though I'm nice. They're thinking there has to be a catch to this. This guy is going to grow horns in a second or something. <laughs> and I said, listen. I said, man, he's taught me a lot over the years. And talked about not being mad at him. And listen, you guys made him. And they, she said, but he, we don't even know how he got out. He's never out. He's not I said, I get that. But honey, the truth is he was out. And here's what you learned today. If you're going to keep a dog with that kind of potential, and you have to make the highest stewardship effort and make sure this never happens again. He can't be out. And if you can't make that happen, then you shouldn't keep the dog. Because I said, wonder if he bit a child, an elderly person coming up your street, or somebody that didn't have the heart that I have. I said, this is a pretty tough day then, isn't it? And they're like, I said, yeah. I said, but praise God, he bit me. <laughs> I said, so this is mercy for you today. I said, because you're never going to hear about this again. You'll never probably see me again. And it ends right here. And I'm just telling you, you take the mercy God gave you and you make sure your dog never does this again to another human being. And you grow wise through this situation. And if you don't know Jesus, please get to know him. He's amazing. He's the one that loves you through me. And I grabbed him and I hugged him, told him I wasn't mad. And, they, and she said, but but don't we need to take you somewhere? Like, shouldn't we, like, take you to the hospital? I said, honey, I got two and a half, almost three miles from I got a half mile to go and two and a half back to the hotel. I got to get my run in. I'm supposed to go do a radio thing, and then I'm preaching to a bunch of pastors. So I said, I need to go. And she said, okay. I said, love you guys. <laughs> Took off. I get back to the hotel, the little girl who I prayed for on the way out and got a little word for, she cried. I said, hey, I said, you prayed for her. A little power and love thing, right? It's just who Jesus is, right? It's not power and love, it's who Jesus is. So it wasn't ministry, it's just loving a girl, seeing in God. So she got really touched. And I took off her and when I come back, she said, well, how was your run? And I said, it was awesome. And she goes, is that blood? Your sock and shoe? Why is your shoe all red? Because my shoe, my running shoe is my running shoe white color. My other one's red. So it just stood out like a sore thumb. I got two different color shoes. She said, is that blood? And there was this little trickle coming out of the hole, just a tiny little line right here. And she saw it and she said, what happened to you? I said, a dog bit me. I said, it's all good. I said, it was a big old pit bull. I thought he had a shock collar, but he didn't have a shock collar. <laughs> He's a little mad I was that close to his yard. It was just a territorial thing. He chomped me and went back to the porch, waddling his little behinds, waddling. I'm like, he's like, take that. And I'm like, whoa. <laughs> so isn't it amazing? She said, well, you got to go to the hospital. Now, I'm not telling you not to. So don't read into this and don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not telling you not to, and I'm not going to weigh you unspiritual. I don't need to. I know where I'm at, and I walked with God for 22 years, so please leave me alone. Don't write me letters. I won't even read them. In fact, I live a way that I never preach because people will try to do what I do instead of see what I see. People that respect me will try to do what I do, and then they won't get those results, and they'll turn it into works instead of relationships. So I don't even preach how I live because I don't want to go through all the letters and everybody trying to set me straight and use wisdom. I think I'm doing okay. The first story she told me was her mom getting bit by a dog and how she didn't get treated and it infected and blew up and she felt like a heart beating in it for three days and wanted to amputate that piece of her body. And I said, honey, stop. <laughs> this precious black man comes around the corner. He's a maintenance guy in the hotel. He says, he's a southern Alabama boy. He says, man, you got bit by a dog? I said, yeah. He said, man, you better listen to that girl. I mean, he was just, he was the funnest guy. He said, you need to listen because I got bit by a dog. I said, two people. I mean, two people. And they both have dog bite stories. He said, no, she's right. I got bit, didn't get treated, da, 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 da. And it hurt so bad. 
I said, what are you guys trying to tell me? I said, listen, remember when I prayed with you before I left and how you cried and did it and what else? I'm going to be fine. Listen, he said, well, where was that dog? And where, who's them people? What did you do about it? Did you report that dog? I said, well, this is what I did. And I told him he's the most funniest guy. He says, you did that? I said, yeah. He said, you for real, man. <laughs> you for real. And, and I said, I said, you know, I said, I, I appreciate what you're saying, but that always has bothered me. I said, everybody says that to me. You're for, you know what I like about you? You're for real. And I say, what else is there? I guess hypocrite, half in, half out, not real. It's not a good day when there's a testimony, I like you because you're real. Are you? Is everybody, come on, it shouldn't be an enigma. It should be us. Help me, Jesus. <laughs> like, I don't, wanna, I don't want heaven to remember me for this testimony. He was real. We're all supposed to be real. <laughs> what are we, so tainted that it's real is amazing? Real is us. Okay, enough of that. I'm going to freak out. He said, you for real? And I said, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> he hugged me. We talked. He hugged me. I liked him. When did my radio show. I, I go up and they said, well, the guy you're waiting on, he's running a little late. He got bit by a dog. He got bit by a dog. Is he okay? Oh, he's okay. He's like, loved the people, hugged them. He just, and they told the story to him. So we said, you got to tell that on the radio program. So then I told the whole story on the radio program. He said, he called me. He said, I keep getting requests to replay that and replay that because it's just challenging so many people's perspective. So then I go to the church. Interesting day. I go to the church. I preach to all these pastors and I'm done. It was the last night. Wow, we're done. I sit down, they're crying. I just lined a whole bunch up and spoke over some significant leaders that I felt called to and God was moving. It was just a fun, fun night. There was major leaders standing there shaking and crying and moved on by conviction. And I sit down and when I sit down, guy sits here, guy sits here, guy sits here. And I'm like, and I knew it. They didn't, they, there was no security guys around me the whole time. And I thought, this looks strange. This looks like obvious. Something's up here. Who are these men? Guy leans over. Hey, Dan, I'm officer so-and-so. I said, yeah, I thought something was up. He said, these three guys are with me. We're all four officers, police officers. I said, okay, what's up? Well, we're here to make sure you're out of here safe and you're okay and everything works out fine. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, there's been some threats against you. There's some people that don't like what you say, what you're saying, apparently, and we got reason to believe that, that well, I'll just be honest, there's threats, and it's concerning the well-being of your life. And I went, are you serious? Very serious. That's why we're here. We're going to make sure you get to the hotel. We're going to make sure you get out of town safe. It's our responsibility, et cetera, et cetera. I said, oh, man. I said, listen. I appreciate you and honor you. I can find you in the book of Romans, friend. There's a place for you in society. But it ain't here right now. I said, this is spiritual. It's called intimidation. You got to face intimidation or you'll run from it the rest of your life. I'm just telling you, sir, you can't shadow me. You can't protect me. I don't want you around me. I, don't, I want you to refuse this. He said, I strongly disagree. And all due respect, I'm not asking you to agree. I'm asking you to listen to what I'm asking. I said, here's the deal. I'm going to lay it straight. If they say they're going to kill me, we got to play it out. Let's see if they can. I don't think they can. <laughs> my job, my job is to love not my own life unto death. He's my rock in defense. When you defend yourself, he's not. When you face intimidation and crush it and upstage it, you won't ever run from it and it won't follow you around. About the time I lead them policemen to walk me out of there for my well-being and safety and protect me because I have a family and all the stuff we say, the sentimental stuff, then the next church I go to preach at, they're going to blow up the Sunday school if I preach. Bomb threat. Where does it end? So I'm glad they handled it the way they, they came right at me. We're going to kill him. 
I personally don't think you can. I'm never going to die. <laughs> so it's really not a heavy threat. And you preach like this, and it sounds rah-rah in the pulpit. But when you have the policeman sitting there telling you that that's the deal, then you find out what you believe. And I can tell you, I was very calm, and it wasn't a threat, because I'm not going to die. So I understand something about that. I'm not telling you to do that. I'm telling you I did it, and don't write me letters to change my mind. You're too late. So they diffused it, and I hung out and talked and did what I do every time, and I was one of the last ones to leave the parking lot. And I drove to that little hotel and took my car and never looked over my shoulder. And I'm here today, and everything worked out fine. Yeah? He said, well, Dan, you should have used wisdom. Whose? Your fear of my well-being or my understanding? I'm just saying, I'm not being mean. It's a different wisdom. And it's a choice I made in faith, and God backs that stuff. And you wouldn't have been marked unspiritual by me if you'd have left them protect you, them cops. I'm just saying I know how it works, and I'd have to live it out, and I'm just going to stop it right now. We're just going to stop it now. Yeah? So that was all just one day. Bit by the dog, got to love the people. Got told about two dog bites, and I better get some help. And then they want to kill me. I'm thinking, I'm not really that bad of a guy. <laughs> Dogs are biting me. People are threatening me. I'm like, gee. And I ain't even picking a fight. But I'm not afraid of one. Because you love not your own life unto death. I don't think I've ever picked a fight, but I'm not afraid of one. If you squeeze me, I promise you, you're going to get Jesus. If you treat me unjust, I'm going to weep for you in my bedroom when nobody's looking. And I'm not going to be mad at you. I don't know how to be. I'm going to cry for you because if you really knew him, you wouldn't treat me that way. And my heart's going to hurt for you. And Holy Spirit's going to hear my prayer and come and get you. <laughs> I'm just telling you. It's just I'm the wrong person to mess with if you don't want change. Especially don't do me wrong, because I'll do you right. I'm just telling you, I will bless you. I will pray and prophesy over you in my bedroom. And mean it. Not a warfare thing. Mean it. Why does a spouse cheat on a spouse? And the spouse that was cheated on becomes broken, trusted, brokenhearted, and cheated on. Rarely do I see that spouse break and cry for the spouse that cheated and realize the spouse is in grave trouble and deceived. Usually they get hurt and broken by their actions and say, I can't go on and I'll never be able to trust again and they broke my heart forever. And we all seem to understand that language. And when you talk a different language like walking in love and hurting for the other person, we kind of go, what? And we kind of give ourselves away. Yeah? Come on. Why is it such a strange thought to cry for people when they really do wrong things towards you? Isn't that what Jesus did with his life? Are we supposed to sing to him and pray to him when we're needy, or are we supposed to follow him? Watch this. It just takes me a while to get to where I'm going. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord, as His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue. Now watch this. This is where I'm heading. By which we've been given exceedingly great and precious promises. Watch. He's not talking about full vats and barns. He's not talking about needs met. He's talking about the grace available to change our lives if we're willing. Watch. You have great and precious promises that through these promises you may be partakers of the divine nature, which is what? What's the divine nature of God? <laughs> Having escaped the corruption, look what the born-again experience does. 
God gives you promises that will transform you if you're willing and believe and live in faith, and it will save you and, snare, and snatch you out of darkness into the light. It will deliver you from what? Watch. From the corruption that's in the world through lust. has nothing to do with pornography. It has nothing to do with a woman. That word lust means self-centered, unsatisfiable desire. His gospel has come and given me all things that pertain to life and godliness. And he's backed it with exceedingly great and precious promises that assure I'll have everything necessary on his end if I'm willing to be changed into his nature and become everything that he is in me and be snatched out of the corruption that's all around me by men seeking their own. That's what that scripture says. So born again is escaping the corruption of men living for themselves. So the biggest lie on the planet isn't the workings of the devil. It's men living for themselves when they're created for God's image. The devil just works with what you give him. Jesus said, the ruler of this world cometh and has nothing in me. We can follow that. It says, he who keeps himself, the evil one touches him not. Yay? Look, I know I talked a long, long, long time. I flew a long way to talk a long time. I did. I, I didn't think about that till just now. I thought, you know what? I sat on that plane for five hours to preach to you. So I might as well preach for five. No. <laughs> I don't know if this will help you, but I'm on Eastern time. So it's four minutes till 12. To me. Can you tell? It's four minutes to nine to you. You got three hours to catch me. <laughs> and when you do, I'll be three hours ahead again. <laughs> so you can't catch me. So you ought to just be okay, because it's really late to me right now. <laughs> do you know what time I got up to go to the airport? Four in the morning. That's one your time. So that's like you getting up at one in the morning, standing here right now with no really now. Jesus in me. It's his fault. So you just think with me. So don't say, boy, he preached long. No, this is important. This is serious. I fly like I fly and do what I do because I think it matters. I think it'll make a difference. I actually believe what I preach. Do you understand that I'm not mandated to be here and don't need to be here? I'd like to tell you this. I, Chris, I'd like to tell you that Jesus appeared in my bedroom and said, Go to them. Spoke your name, vision of the building. Yes, Lord. It just didn't happen that way. He emailed me. I met him in Orange County. I remembered him. Joey sent me, a, one of you guys sent me a picture. And I was like, all oh, them guys are cool. They're hungry and it's a bunch of young folks. And then I just ended up calling. We made it. We just did it, right? I go to six, I go to six percent of my invite. This year, it's probably way less than that because my invites are off the hook. It doesn't even make sense. There's so much hunger out there, it's exciting. But here's my point. I'm not here because I have to be. Nobody mandated me to come. Jesus didn't tell me I needed to come here. He didn't even say you need to travel. I'm preaching all over YouTube. I could probably sit in my yard and sip iced tea and watch my garden grow. <laughs> I'm preaching all over the world. We, we go into Denny's to eat today, and the lady said, I know you. What's your name? Dan. Last name, Moeller. Dan Moeller. And I'm like, she said, I watch you on YouTube. She, then this other girl comes out, Dan Moeller. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> I just stay home. I'm already preaching. I'm here because I want to be. I believe what I'm telling you. And I want you to catch this. I'm not saying this to hype. I believe your lives are worth this or he wouldn't have shed his blood. I wouldn't fly here if I didn't think you could live this way. I certainly didn't fly here to impress you with my preaching. I don't even preach. I just kind of, yeah? I'm just, yeah, I actually felt like tonight was pretty intense. I was like, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> I didn't slap nobody. Just having fun. Yeah. 
say, I don't know, brother. You're pretty close. <laughs> the passion. Do you see passion in me? I believe it. He paid his blood for this thing. He gave his life so we can understand and go, whoa, and look to him and he be lifted up and draw all men to him. He wants us to get it, to understand, not be benefited, but really understand and be changed. Yeah, it's not just blessing. It's not you getting a better job. I hope you do. I really do. But if you don't, do you shine? If they don't treat you right, do you still love? If your prayer didn't get answered, do you still pray? That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about relationship and covenant. Not genie in a bottle, busboy, a table waiter. I'm talking father. <laughs> you have every reason to be excited, ecstatic, and encouraged. Christ came and was crucified and rose from the dead and wants to put his life in you, his ways in you, his person in you. You have every reason to be thankful and pumped. I'm serious. Listen, my wife went into crisis for six years in her identity. She wouldn't even come to church and I was a pastor. She believed people called her because she was so messed up. And I lived for six years as if I was married and almost single and had no real access to the heart of my wife because of the delusion and lies. I know people that won't live six days that way without falling apart. I know people that would never go six weeks without giving up and maybe looking for someone else. I lived that way for six years and didn't even know how to be touched by it because I don't wake up for her to love me. I wake up to be like him. And in that, I realize she needs Jesus more than ever in her life. In that six-year season, she's in trouble. She needs Jesus more than any time I've known her. And he happens to live in me, friend. So now's not the time to be a frustrated husband that goes to church. Now's time to be like him. And you know what happened? The goodness of God snapped that lie and changed her. My wife is awesome. My wife's the best. She is. She's sensitive. She's loving. She's discerning. She's a servant deluxe, and you would want her praying for you. She's amazing. But I'll tell you what, for six years, she was in deep trouble and chaos and turmoil because of a lie, believing that everybody loved me and she was just my wife. And they said hi to her because she was with me. That's a good way to zap your identity. Don't find your identity through your husband. Don't find your identity through your wife. Find it through Jesus and him crucified. You're not trying to be like him or her. You're being like him. Brandon, I need your help real quick. It's on purpose. Because see, because we're even a different shade, man. You can see that, right? <laughs> this is my buddy. He's from Kentucky. He came with me. All right, now watch this. This is Brandon, yeah. And I'm Dan, watch. Yeah, he's a man of God. Watch this. And I'm Dan, he's Brandon. Now, I just told you that. Now, tomorrow or later tonight, you're going to say, now, are you Dan? Do we look anything alike? Are you, are you going to mix us up and think he's Dan and I'm Brandon and say, man, they're just so close, I can't tell. But well, watch this. He's Brandon. He looks like Brandon. I'm Dan. I look like Dan. You'll never mix that up. But we can both look like him. And that's the power of the gospel. He's Brandon in him. Him and Brandon. I'm, yeah? And we can both look just like him. That's the power of the gospel. You get it? Okay. Okay. So live this thing, guys. You say, how? Relationship. When you get home, get alone. Even if you're married, you guys tuck in, whatever that means. You're, before you fall asleep, you talk to the Lord tonight. You get personal. You're in the bathroom and it's just you alone. God, I give my life to you even more at a different level maybe. I'm just surrendering everything I am to you. Keep teaching me, Holy Spirit, what it means to be selfless without getting legalistic and, and never just thinking for myself, but thinking for your great name and others. I want to be like you. And don't weigh yourself for where you're not. Enjoy becoming. You're not running the risk of failing. You're enjoying becoming. 
So even if you make a mistake or get into a bad attitude, when you catch it, rejoice and go, wow, truth's changing my life. There was a time before this truth I would have stayed there and thought I had a right to be there. Now I know it's not you. Let's just keep growing. Let's not let the ball drop on this thing. Let's be the steward of your own heart, your own faith, your own life. Don't steward other people. Steward yourself. And you become like Jesus. You say, well, but my spouse doesn't, we're not talking about your spouse, we're talking about you in Christ. Do you think you're going to stand before Jesus and look into his amazing eyes of liquid love and fire and whatever it's going to be like and go, because oh, it's, it's light, there's no deception in him. When you stand before him, the little foxes are all out in the light. Do you think you're going to be able to go, oh, 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 I mean, you know, I would have believed in you more if it wasn't for my spouse. I'd have served you better. I'd have done better. If, why didn't you answer my prayer? Why didn't you get me out of that miserable job? Do you think you're going to be able to even think that then? It's going to be so foolish, so let it be foolish now. Don't let it work now. If it's not going to work then, don't let it work now. Yeah. So live this thing. I'm going to pray over you guys. I'm not a real altar call guy on this stuff. Listen, your altar's your heart before God. You're the one that has to live with your own conscience. Honestly, I've seen a, a lot of altar calls. I, I only do it if the Lord really tells me to, the altar call thing. I've seen it just a lot of emotion and people. And it, there's a place for you to just get real and meet with God in your heart. There's a place for you to get alone in your bed, get alone in the bathroom. You know what, God? You never made me for me. James says, the book of James says that if there's selfishness in your life, if there's self-seeking in your heart, don't boast and lie against the truth. Deal with it, address it, and call it what it is, and let the gospel get it out of there. In other words, zero permission for self-centeredness. Zero. James 3. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them prove by the good conduct of their life that their works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your heart, don't boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom never came from above. It's earthly, sensual, and demonic. Where there's envy and self-seeking, there's every evil work present. So here we are rebuking the devil and inviting him through our motivation. We're chanting and rebuking, I bind you, devil, and your whole motive is you're selfish and frustrated and mad at your spouse. God, cut him down. God, cut her down. Knock him off their eye horse. Devil, you loose him. I bind you. And the whole time you're praying for yourself because you know if God changes him, your day will go better. And you're not praying because you love him. You're praying because you're mad at him and you can't take anymore. And how much am I supposed to take, God? Why don't you break them? And the whole time you're rebuking, you're inviting. And if God answers your prayer, he's going to teach you to stay that way. That's why those prayers don't get answered. I never see those prayers answered. You don't pray for yourself. You pray for his name and for others. You don't say, I can't take it anymore. If Jesus said that, he'd have jumped ship, he'd have never went to the cross, and you wouldn't have his spirit. Come on, if Jesus said that one time, yeah, but I can't take anymore. If God said that about you for one day, you're hopeless. If God just looked at your life and said, I can't take anymore. If Jesus just elbowed the Father, didn't I shed my blood for them? Didn't Holy Spirit convict them like six weeks ago strong? Yeah. Well, they're doing it again. Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, but how much am I supposed to take, Father? I mean, come on, it really hurts me to know that I shed my blood, Holy Spirit convicted them, they know better, and they're going to do it anyway. Look, if they're not for us, they're against us. I'm just, I'm just telling you. <laughs> do you see how foolish that sounds when you put it in God's mouth? It all sounds foolish in yours. You're made for His image. He didn't teach us that language. Life apart from Him did. I'm trying to stop, and somehow I can. I'm sorry. I'm, it's after midnight. To me, it's after midnight. It's just important, guys. If not, we're going to teach ourselves religion. We're going to learn how to do church without becoming her. And that would be sad. 
I don't think the devil's impressed when you all pile up front here and sing. He's impressed when you love not your own lives unto death and pursue the image of God. He's not threatened by worship services. He's seen thousands of them. He's seen people leave countless times and argue in the car and fight at home. He's not impressed with both hands raised. He's impressed when hearts surrender and word becomes flesh. He doesn't even come to take you out. He comes for the word's sake. Somehow we take the devil personal. He's coming for the kingdom. He could care less about you. He just doesn't want you ever believe in the kingdom. Well, the devil's out to get me. No, he isn't. He wants to stop destiny, purpose, and potential, and he's afraid of the word. You're in a demon war against the kingdom of God. And if you take adversity personal, you're going to make a big mistake. You get to fight on behalf of the king. Stand your ground and live with integrity and character and honor. I mean it. It's just the truth. And it's not because you opened a door and because you, we always say, well, what door did I open? Well, how come the devil, what? Come on, the same storm to the wise and the foolish. It's not because the wise opened a door. It's because he was wise and the word came. Why'd the storm come? Because the word came. So the wise man, the storm had no power over because what was built stood. The storm wasn't trying to kill the occupant. It was trying to destroy the building. And we take adversity personal and make big mistakes. We let what we're going through decide how we're doing instead of what he went through decide how we're doing. And we identify ourselves by our go-through instead of his. It's just true, guys. The foolish man, great was the fall. What was built never really got built, did it? Same storm, wise and foolish. Being wise didn't keep the wise man from the storm. Being wise kept everything built established and the storm had no power over it. Don't think if you're doing everything right, you'll never go through the storm. The goal is not going through the storm. The goal is standing in truth. And you won't even see the storm because the truth already has you strong. That's powerful, guys. Let's not misunderstand. A lot of us are praying to avoid fire because we're afraid of it. We say, pray for me that I get a good report. I understand what we're saying, but at the same time, the report's what moves us. This is the number one prayer. Pray, I'm going for testing. Pray I get a good report. I know what we're saying, but the truth is the report moves us. And if you're not careful, you get moved by the report, and then all your prayer motive is fear and what they told you. And Come on. Somebody's told they're going to die. You've got to be careful you don't become a dying man before you pray. You're in covenant. You don't pray because of the problem. You pray because you have promise. You have destiny. You have a legacy to write. You're not praying because of the fear of death. You're praying because of the promise of life. There's a difference. You're not praying because of sentiment and emotion and because family and all the stuff we pray. How many times have we prayed that stuff and they, they just go on and die and we get perplexed? I'm just talking straight, guys. Don't pray because of fear. You pray because of belief in Him. We're going to pray for the sick, okay? I'm done. I'm going, I'm going to pray something over you guys. No, i got to quit. I'm not done, but i got other sessions, so I'm just going to trust we'll get it all done this week. For some reason, my heart's raging right now. I feel like I just started. <laughs> no, I, I don't want to scare you. I'm not going anymore. I'm done. I'm done, but I feel like there's a lot to say. And it's not because you're doing wrong, it's because God believes you can handle it and become it, and he's calling you to it. You know, sometimes people get the idea of a preacher's preaching something, it's because we're doing that wrong in our lives. I wonder if he's just telling you who you are and reaffirming and keeping you strong. Why do we, why, we shouldn't be threatened by the message. We shouldn't say, oh, there must be a lot of trouble in this room. <laughs> no, we don't want that mindset. I think there's a lot of potential in this room. And I think there's a lot of legacy to leave. I think there's a lot of impact to have. So if we talk and teach like this, maybe we'll walk in what we're created for. Maybe it's not because there's something wrong. Maybe it's to keep you from going there and believing it's okay. Maybe it protects you, right? You don't leave here and say, boy, I got a long way to go, brother. <laughs> no, you leave here and say, man, that was encouraging. Light was just set on the trail. Life makes sense now. Man, I just got direction. 
I think I was ambling and now I'm directed. Wow, I got, wow. Yeah? Amen. Amen. Okay. I'm going to pray something over you. Open your heart and all you want to do is want this, okay? You just want, yes, God, I want to become love. I want to receive grace in my life, precious promises to partake of your divine nature. I don't want to live a selfish man. Holy Spirit, expose that thing in my life every time and just make me more like you. You want that, right? See, because to become love, you have to want to be. And I've learned that in a room this size, there's a whole handful of people that really, when it comes down to it, don't want to become love. They've drawn lines. Well, if, and you're telling me that if somebody, I'm saying, and they have all these analogies, and there's hidden chips on men's shoulders. You have to say yes to become in love if grace is going to make you love. You have to say yes. You have to sincerely say yes. So if you're sincere, yes, I'm going to pray. I'm believing grace is going to touch your life. And even if you're not a yes, man, it's so good to preach this way because God plows ground and stirs hearts and makes good things out of folks. Amen? Amen. So, Father, I just pray grace over this house, over every person, and I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come in a special, intimate, personal way. And I thank you that every one of us can live what was preached tonight apart from any other factor in our life. There's not one thing in our lives that's greater than what you called us to and created us for. And I'm just asking you to turn our eyes to truth and turn our eyes to faith and let this room be strongly encouraged. And let no other factor be greater than what you called us to. And God, let the hunger in their hearts be enough to take them past the trial. Let the desire to become more like you and the honor we have for you be enough to take us through challenges. So much, Lord, that we wouldn't even see them as challenges anymore, and it's not because we're in denial. It's not because we're pressing down and pushing down and stuffing feelings. It's because we've been changed. And I'm asking of grace, Lord, to come in this room to change us in a special way and let this night land on every other night that's ever been ministered and just add fuel to a holy fire and let this night make a difference. Lord, I'm asking what was sown here to grow. I'm asking that it wouldn't be out in left field or on thorny ground or choked out by weeds. I'm asking, Lord God, that what was sown here would grow. That, Lord God, it would produce 30, 60, and 100 fold in our lives and that you would reproduce yourself again and again. I pray grace over this house and I ask God for grace to walk in this truth. And most of all, to maintain a healthy, sincere desire to do that very thing. I pray against distraction. I pray, Lord God, that we wouldn't grow deceived or weary in well-doing. That you teach us to keep our hearts sharp and before you. And I thank you, Lord, for the stewardship, the grace of stewardship in this room tonight. That each person would take their own life responsible and into their own heart and own hand and be the steward of their life. God, fix our eyes single. No distraction. Man, I hear that twice. No distraction. God, let us keep our eyes on you. I bless this house and I pray for every person in this place this grace to come upon them. Young and old alike. And no, it's not too late. See, I hear that thought in an elderly person. It's not too late. So you didn't hear this this strong when you were younger or before. Or you heard it and didn't hear it and respond. You're hearing it now, friend. Let God be the redeemer of your day. And let God do more through this truth in your latter years. And let him redeem the time. Don't you get analytical and say it's too late. I should have heard this 20 years ago. You're hearing it now, friend. Let the next couple years matter more. And let God do more than maybe had been done all those years if he'd have just been growing. God, I'm asking for that radical change. I'm telling you, I heard a heart say, well, that's great for most of these guys. It's just a little late for me now. It's never too late for you to walk in love. It's never too late for you to sow a seed. It's never too late for you to become what he paid for. So I'm telling you, there was somebody thinking that. You know who you were. I, I said it right when you were thinking. So God's saying, no, no, no. Don't you go there and talk yourself out of what I'm saying to your heart. Father, thank you in Jesus' name. 
I'm not having an altar call. I just hear this, just little addictions, compulsions in, in people's lives in this room. I'm telling you, God's going to break them off for you tonight. And here's how he's telling me he's going to break them. When you leave here tonight, you say, Father, my life is more than whatever it is. You paid a high price for me and you love me and I thank you my value is greater. And you start talking to God about how valuable you are to Him or He wouldn't have paid a high price. And in that, you're going to start making the tree good and the fruit's going to change. It's not always a deliverance thing, guys. It's a seeing the truth and continuing in it and it makes you free. So Father, I just thank you for a deliverance from little vices and little habits and addictions that have violated consciences. God, things that have caused people to second guess their own integrity and their own lives. And I thank you in the face of those things tonight, they have the faith and find the grace to look to you and thank you for your love. And I thank you that your love comes and brings change. And I thank you these little vices, they stop. In the authority of Jesus' name, I pray freedom over these people through a healthy identity. And I pray that no one would live with a veiled face. I pray that we'd be open-faced before you, God, and change. I'm telling you, there's a bunch of folks that's settling on right now. You leave here and be nothing but loved by God. You're not disappointing him because he's not thinking for himself. He loves you. So don't believe lies. You're not guilty, condemned, or ashamed because he forgives and he's promoting life. So come out from under that thing. Stop wearing it. And say, you know what? My life is more than this. And I'm telling you, there's grace to change. In Jesus' name, I bless you in that. If you're in a marriage right now and your marriage and your spouse is sitting right with you and you heard this message for you, not for them, and you're saying, man, you know what? It does take two to tango and I've been fueling fires and I've been starting fires and I haven't been thinking about being like Jesus. I'm telling you, the testimonies I'm getting from this little thing I'm doing right now in faith is mind-boggling. But if you'll reach down, if you'll find their hand, if you'll get their hand and squeeze their hand and don't pull your hand away, spouse, and you just squeeze their hand and when you squeeze their hand, what you're saying is, Honey, I just want you to know I'm listening to this man and not for you. I'm listening for me. Man, I haven't been pursuing the truth and I haven't been pursuing to be like Jesus. And forgive me for everything less that I've been. And I want you to know I love you. I'm sorry. And I'm hearing this man. And I'm asking you for grace because I'm beginning to change. And I'll tell you the greatest thing you can do, spouse, is squeeze their hand back. Real gentle. As if to say, no, ditto, honey, I'm hearing too. And not for you, I'm hearing for me. So I receive that and I ask you to forgive me as well. And I just want to call all things new and I want to move forward in this truth. So thanks for releasing me and loving me and giving me a chance. I'm telling you, if you'll do that right now and you'll squeeze each other's hand gently with that statement behind that squeeze without a word, there's a grace to restore, redeem, and make days brand new. I thank you, Father, right now with, with those hands squeezed. That's good. There's, no, there's a handful of couples doing that. That's good. I thank you for total redemption in their home and their marriage. I thank you you bring a new day. I thank you there is no more unresolved. I thank you yesterday make it meaningless. It doesn't matter. It doesn't need disgust. God, a new day today. Repentant hearts. A release of one another. A release of themselves. A new day. I ask for restoration, redemption in homes and marriages. In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 Good. Okay. Let me move along here. We're not going to take terrible long with this because it's almost 1230. So we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll do this, though. There's a teaching here, okay? If you can stay, stay. If you can't, I understand. I preached a long time. I get it. But if you can stay, it's, it's good. It won't be religious. It'll be fun. It'll be time for things to change, okay? And it's a training time. It empowers you. It gets you involved. I'm not lining you up here to pray for you. And at the end of this time, I don't want a bunch of people, please, running up asking me to pray for them for a bunch of stuff. That's what we're going to do in a minute. And whoever prays for you, I promise you, it'll be enough. Jesus is enough in this room. 
He paid a price to live in us, guys. Let's start letting him do that. And let's start believing he'll, he'll move through me, he'll love through me, and he'll heal through me, okay? Okay, with healing, I think we've been way too complex. I think we've got ourselves overtaught. We've tried to teach through our lack of things, the unanswered prayers and the things that haven't happened. You guys with me? So when we pray for the sick, we tend to teach through what hasn't happened instead of teach through his life and his word. Does that make sense? So you could take an average altar minister in a church and they're so taught through experiences that, oh, wow, they're really negative. Wow, that sounds like fear. Wow, I don't know if they understand. And all of a sudden, you might have three strikes against the person you go pray for in your teaching and three reasons why they might not get healed. But you pray anyway because it's what you're supposed to do because you're in the altar team, but you don't believe they're going to be healed because you're putting it all on them and what they're saying and thinking and feeling. But what I'm telling you is we have this great privilege of carrying the kingdom and ministering the kingdom here regardless of what anybody sees or knows. We've had people in the streets that say, well, I don't even believe in healing. And we're like, that's fine. Just let us pray. Just hold still. And they don't even believe, and they're letting us know that. And it's just a fun thing. Sometimes we get beliefs like, well, if they're a Christian, it's harder because, and they're more accountable. And you start getting those beliefs. Let's just push all our experience away on what it's trying to teach us, and let's let Jesus teach us, okay? So here's what we're going to do tonight, real quick. There's two types of sickness. There's a lot of sickness on the earth, but there's two categories I put it in when I do this. Who's ever been out in public or at work and you heard somebody talking about a situation that comes and goes, something they've been struggling with, or man, I hope that pain doesn't show up later today. Who's ever talked about, it? heard somebody talk like that? Migraine or whatever. Or man, when I get off my break and have to go back and sit on that chair, I hope my sci that sciatic thing doesn't start. You know what I'm saying? When you hear that, you have nothing to gauge healing on other than simple faith in your heart, true? You have nothing you can test, check, or show. And the thing we need to know is even if a body doesn't change, it's no, we, we got to stop turning it into a hit and miss. We got to stop saying, well, God either healed or he didn't. We got to start learning to believe. We got to learn to lay hands on the sick and the sick recover. One of our biggest fears in praying for the sick is that nothing happens. When I survey folks and say, why would you ever hesitate in praying for the sick? I'll find people that say it's new to them or they don't pray. Well, why? Well, my biggest fear is when I pray for the sick, nothing will happen. So they don't pray for the sick, so they always have their biggest fear. In some weird way, it's self-preservation. They don't want to face what they're fearing, so they don't pray for the sick, so they always have nothing. Do you get it? So come on, let's not make it about you and me. Let's just start praying for the sick. I heard a man I respect a long time ago say, I, I'm, I'm convinced of this. If we just start laying hands on the sick, the more people we pray for, the more things we'll see. Yeah? And the more things that we'll see happen. So here's what I want to do real quick. If, if, if you got a sickness in your body and you were healed tonight, there'd be no way to tell in the moment because it's a condition that's internal, we would need a test, or you'd need time to tell. Are you following me? I just need you to get up real quick out of your chair. If you need healing in an area of your life, there'd be no way to physically test that thing. It would just have to, time would tell. A hard day of work, sitting, longer than I made you sit, whatever. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Say you had a migraine and it comes once a week and it just didn't hit and it ain't there now, but it comes once a week. There'd be no way to know until a week goes by or two or three weeks. You see what I'm saying? You guys understand it. Stand up with me if you're in that category. Guys, we won't even have to get out of your chairs right now. We're not going to ask them what's wrong. Listen, when we pray for you, I just want you to believe this, that he really does love me or he'd have never sent his son. And watch, this condition is no threat to his love. His love is a threat to this condition. We get it backwards. We say, well, yeah, but why, if God loved me, why am I going through this? And No, no, no. He loves you to address it, okay? His, his love's never challenged by your life. His love's established through the cross. Do you get it? So when you stand up for prayer tonight like this, the only thing I want you to do, I don't want you standing here putting on your... Come on, God. You just believe he loves you, and the proof of his love is his son crucified, okay? So if you guys are sitting, you just can picture somebody, stretch towards somebody your hand. You don't have to get out of your chairs. 
You guys just stand. I'm going to pray corporately. They're all going to agree. We're all going to pray over you together. And then we're going to let you sit down. It won't be without results, I'm telling you. These things are going to change. You didn't stand up for nothing, I'm telling you. And you're going to see. And then you want to, I want you to tell people in the next day, two, three, whatever it takes for you to realize this really did change, I want you to tell some folks and testify what he did, okay? And then be encouraged to start ministering the same truth to others. So just receive his love and believe he loves you and thank him personally. Say, wow, I thank you. You love me and you're making things new in my life. I believe it. And that's why you crucified your son. So, Father, we pray for wholeness all through this room. Healing come in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you these conditions never return. I thank you, Lord God, these symptoms never return. I thank you these people that took the faith and the time to stand experienced total change in this thing. And Lord God, I thank you right now. There's a clean sweep through this room of your love and your redemptive grace in Jesus' name. And God, I thank you for it. So be healed and be whole. Sickness never come again. Dysfunction no more. Symptoms no way. In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Okay. That's good stuff. I know it sounds simple to the unbeliever, but it's not simple. He paid a price. Grab your seats. We're going to do the last part. It's fun. It's fun. This part's fun to me. So here's what I need you to do. If you're sick in your body tonight and you were healed, you would know it if you were healed because you could simply check your body. And it, here's what I don't want tonight. I don't want emotions. I don't want exaggeration. I don't want you to look at the big brown eyes of the young girl that prayed for you and think, oh man, I got to tell her I feel better. I don't want to let her down. I've been around us a while. I know the stuff we do. I can't have you doing that. That would be called lying. Okay? Yeah. So I need you to stand to your feet. If you're sick in this room, and if you were healed, there'd be some way for you to check. If you can't stand to your feet and want prayer, just go like this. We'll see. But stand to your feet if you can and you want prayer in this room. Please don't not stand if you need something, if you're less than whole. Don't like stay in your chair because you say, you know, I always stand and nothing ever happens. Please don't stay in your chair. Come on, guys. I'm giving you a little time. Don't make me go fishing. I'm actually a very good fisherman. I shouldn't have to go fishing. Just stand. Just be in faith. Just say, you know what? I'm going to believe God's love tonight. I'm just going to believe. Here's the thing. When we preach this, we don't preach faith as a point in time. You're never running the risk of not getting it. If you don't ever believe, you always run the risk of not believing. These signs follow those that... So if you were the enemy, what would you try to scramble in the body of Christ? What we believe. It's not, it's not rocket science. So here's the deal. Do I have everybody? I got, no, I don't. I, I, have, I have a handful of people. I got like an eight people. I got eight people that have specifically arthritis symptoms and pains that are still in their chairs. I'm telling you. It's eight of them. I need you to stand. Stand. One, two, three, four, five. Good. Six. I need you to stand. I, I think I need two more. Thank you. I think I need one more. I don't, you might have stood, but I, nope, thanks. Is that you? Did you just stand? Arthritis stuff or something? Is that you? Yeah, the guy in the t-shirt right there. You just looked over at her. Is that you? You just, I'm just making sure I got my eight because I know when I hear numbers. Now listen. If God didn't mean business and he wasn't ready to bring change, why would he give me that? Come on, if this is just the end of the service thing, why would he want to wait for you and not move forward until you got up if he wasn't meaning business? Yeah. <laughs> yeah? So do we have everybody? Or are you going to make me go fishing again? Don't make me go fishing. I'm really good fishing. I was in a service about two months ago, and I described a lady to a tea in her kitchen. The things she did and the things she said, she just started bawling and stood up. Before we prayed for anybody, she was already healed. God just had so much mercy. She just, 
wasn't standing. I don't know why it's hard for people sometimes. Okay, so I'm just believing we got everybody. Now here's what I need you to do. I'm going to come up here so you can see me and I can see everybody because I want to just help this along. Okay, raise your hands real high if you stood up for prayer. Just one hand, just one hand. It's only so we can locate you. Now listen, I want you to participate. The people that are sitting, I want you to be my prayer team, okay? Now I know we didn't have any formal training, but we'll have simple training in a second and it'll be powerful. But I need you guys that are sitting to help me. And if you're nervous and you say, this makes me uncomfortable, I want you on my team. Like the people that are nervous are the ones I want the most on my team because you won't, you won't rely on yourself. And there's a place for you to step through that nervousness. Let's be a Christian Nike commercial tonight and just do it. Okay? So keep your hands raised till they come and get you. Some of you that are in the middle and stuff, why don't you get out where they can reach you so people can get to you? Like if you're all stuffed in the middle, get, get your, make your way out so we can get to you. Okay, keep your hand up. Only put your hand down when somebody claims you. Get up, have fun with it. Say, hey, you're mine tonight. Don't anybody pray yet. Just wait. We're going to do it together. Just go claim somebody till we got everybody accounted for. I got a whole bunch over here, guys. Why don't some of this army, I got a lot of army over here. Why don't some of you get over here? I got a lot of hands. Go claim somebody. Say, hey, you're mine tonight. You might want to have fun and say, I've never done this before. I'm going to pray for you. I got about five, six hands over there. Can I have some people help me over there? Put your hand down if you get claimed. Put your hand down if you're claimed. Come on, I got one, two, three. I still see two guys there. I see somebody in the back. The guy in a white t-shirt. Put your hand up if nobody claims you right there. You got him? Nobody got you yet? Yeah? Good. You got him? Okay, guys, listen up. Let's do this. We'll do this together and it won't take long. It's going to be fun. You watch and see what happens in the next couple mi minutes here. I'm just telling you, it's going to be fun. First of all, thanks for standing up, guys, for prayer, and thanks for helping, guys, that we're sitting. Gee, I'm telling you, you have no idea. I, I won't cry. I could. Jesus likes this. What you guys are doing right now, Jesus is all about. It's way more powerful than if we're lining everybody up and the guest speaker prays for all the sick. I'm telling you, what I'm looking at in this room, Jesus likes this. He likes that you're getting involved because he paid for you to be involved. He paid to live inside of you. Now here's the deal. I'm only giving you six seconds to pray. There's a reason. It's very simple. Watch. Your prayer never has and never will heal anybody. It's not your prayer. It's what you believe about what he accomplished in his love for the person. Watch. Be healed in Jesus' name is probably plenty if there's a revelation of his love and finished work. Here's what I'm convinced the Lord told me about a year ago to do every night I do this. I do this usually on the first night when I travel and it's never religious to me. It's training, it's empowering. Watch. He showed me this about a year ago. He said, people are trying too hard. They're sincere or they wouldn't try too hard. But they're trying to pray right, pray powerful, pray scriptural, and they get very self-conscious before they even open their mouth. And they're more thinking about what they're praying than God wanting to heal and make right through his son. Does that make sense? So your prayer, this is actually good news, your prayer never has and never will heal anybody. You ought to be like, phew, I don't got to produce anymore. I don't have to try so hard. I just need to be sincere and believe that the person I'm about to pray for, he absolutely loves with his life. And that he's making intercession for this person and his blood's speaking better things. That because of what he accomplished through the cross, I can release faith and believe God to restore because of what he did and how he loves. You get to facilitate that, proclaim that, or believe that. So if they tell you, I have arthritic symptoms in my body, I got pains and stiffness in my body shutting down or slowing up in areas or immobile, and you just say, arthritis, you leave. Every trace, every symptom, every pain, you go now in Jesus' name. Who knows you can do that in six seconds? Who knows if you believe you can say to the mountain in six seconds? They say, well, I'm bone on bone in my knees. 
My knees grind when I walk, and they hurt so bad. I'm a little afraid of surgery and anesthesia, so I've been putting up with it, but man, my knees hurt. They're bone on bone. Knees, you be whole. Cartilage, be restored. No more pain. Jesus' name. Who knows you can do that in six seconds and be sincere? Who knows you can take the pressure off of you because you can't build the cartilage. So there's no technique in saying it right to get the cartilage to cooperate. It's, it's the Lord. And you're believing that He's just that amazing and He's just that good and He's just that real. Yeah? Who knows we can do this? Because He already did it on that cross. Yeah? So we get to participate in something awesome. Now, here's the cool thing. The cynical would say this is a cop-out. It's not a cop-out. It's something we're growing in. Face not a point in time. It's not a hit, miss, win, or new, lose. You're not threatened by standing up. It's not anymore. we got to throw this out the, the church door. We'll wonder if it doesn't happen. We'll wonder if God doesn't heal. It's never, I don't know why he did, why he didn't. Faith believes. Faith's the position of your heart. You're laying hands on the sick, and the sick are recovering. There's times in these sessions, we're going to see tonight people healed instantly. We're probably going to see some people that feel somewhat better, noticeably better, but not all the way. There might be a few people that say nothing changed. Let's not be afraid of that. Let's be afraid of not believing and not releasing the kingdom, because here's the deal. We'll take a second time. I'll teach just a couple things. We'll pray six more seconds. Some of those people that felt somewhat changed will be all the way changed. <laughs> and some of those people that felt nothing change will change. It might be possible, I've seen this, where we'll leave and there'll be a handful of people that nothing changed. And some people will still say, well, it's somewhat changed. Who knows that's not defeat. What defeat is, is if you never release faith and never believe in the kingdom. That's already defeat. The children of Israel were greater than the Philistines because of their covenant. They already could beat Goliath, but because they didn't face him, he, they lost by default. He beat them for 40 days because they didn't face him. And it wasn't until a little boy named David said, what are you guys doing? He's already dead meat. He has no covenant. Yeah? yeah? But because they didn't step out and face and believe, they lost by default for all those days. Let's not do that anymore, guys. Let's get involved. Let's pray, believe, and receive. Amen? Amen. Okay, so here's what you're going to do. It's really good and it's really fun. Take just three seconds and ask them why they stood and what you're believing for, and then look back up here. Don't pray yet. Three seconds. Give them the three-second version. Not when I was two. And just three-second version. Just tour rotator cuff, arthritis, cancer. I can't see out of my left eye, whatever. You got it? We good? Three seconds. You should have it. Okay? All right, look up here. We're doing this together as a family. Do you notice I didn't bring this amazing worship team up front? You don't always have the worship team with you, right? So uh, sometimes you feel uncomfortable even. Sometimes you're in a parking lot. Sometimes you're at a gas pump and you just get moved. And You need to learn how to believe, period. This isn't a hype thing. We're not stirring up. It's, tonight's not even about setting an atmosphere. The atmosphere is in you. It's called the King. Okay? So you guys ready? You know what you're praying for? I'm going to give you six seconds. I'll stop you when I say, okay, wrap it up. That just means acknowledge God's love for him, and I mean this. I'll give you an example. As soon as you pray, arthritis you live, every pain you go, mobility be restored in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for your great love. I just always acknowledge God's love. Faith works through love. If you're being prayed for, that's all I want you to do is relax and believe he loves you through his son. Yay. Six seconds, wind down your prayer, and then I want you to legitimately check your bodies. As soon as you know it's changed and that you're healed, I want you to make sure you go like this. I'm going to call on just a few. I'm going to get you to find out, and don't be ashamed of that. Be excited about that. If you're sincerely changed, don't snap it. Don't just go, oh, I'm healed. Make sure. Check that thing out. If you had pain, try to find it. When you can't, let me know, okay? I'm saying, don't be, don't be quick. I want you to be thorough. I don't want exaggeration in the room. 
Then we're going to call on a couple people. Now, here's the deal. If your body doesn't change, don't panic and don't say, see, I just know I'm doing something wrong. I never get healed. Something's blocking my healing. Don't stop that. Okay? I'm telling you, I've been around this thing. Stop that and listen to a few testimonies. As you hear the testimonies, humble your heart, be thankful, and thank God He's a healer, and thank God that He's doing a work in you, and then recheck your body. We could see it like popcorn in here where things that didn't change just start changing because we won't let go. We teach back home our people to not let go. I'm here to teach you don't ever let go. Are you all ready? You didn't forget what you're praying for, right? Okay, I'm a teacher, man. I want to empower you. Okay, you ready? Look at them real quick. Make them a little uncomfortable and just know that they're precious and Jesus paid his blood for them, okay? All right. Ready? You got six seconds. Sincere. Go ahead. Pray. Jesus' name. Oh, that's so good. Listen to that. Okay, guys. Wrap it up. Wind it down in Jesus' name. Father, because you love them. Now you receive his love. You just thank God he loves you. Wrap it up. We're done praying. Start checking your bodies all over this room. No exaggeration. As soon as you know you're healed, I need you to go like this when you're healed. Check your bodies. Go like this. Make sure you wave so I can see you because it's dark out there. Okay, good, good, good. Yeah? For sure? For sure? Who else? Wave your hands. For sure? Yeah? Yeah? Good. Who else? How about over here? We're praying for a lot. Check yourselves over here. Come on. Check your bodies. Anybody over here? You know your body's changed? See, because some people get funny. They're like, well, see, you got to get over to this portal. God's moving in this side of the room. No, God's... You, got, you changed? Good. Anybody else over here? Check your bodies. For sure? Good. Check your bodies. Anybody else you know? I want you to take your time. That's good. Okay. Hang on now. Guys, stop talking for a second. Let's do this. I want... I want stop. Stop. Just for a second. I'm not being mean. I just want to get your attention because it's late and I want to do this. If your body changed for sure and you know you're healed, all at once, I want you to all raise your hands so we see who you are and go like this so we see who you are. Keep them up there. Don't anybody else raise your hand. Sir, right there with both hands. Can you, let's get quiet. Can you holler out what happened to you? What happened? Now, wait a minute. You had gout. You couldn't close your hands. How far could you go? Just like... You could only go like that. So the swelling, the, the protrusion and everything went away. <laughs> Look, he's got like it. He had gout. He was swelled up. He couldn't close his hands. His knuckles were sticking out and everything receded. And you got total, complete normal. Okay, stretch your hands to this man, guys. Father, we thank you God will never return in his life. God, I thank you this isn't an ongoing thing. I thank you it's nothing that can ever, ever, ever come back. Out, you never, ever touch him again. In the authority of Jesus' name, be whole and remain whole. And be a shining light and a testimony of God's great love. In Jesus' name. Amen? That's awesome. If you didn't feel change, every time somebody testifies, check it again. If you didn't feel changed, just check it and stay thankful. Who wants to tell me what happened? Somebody that's healed, you want to share it? Yeah? Honey in the blue, go ahead. You called her? She called her mom on the phone, said, hey, we're praying for the sick. She said, my mom got healed. What happened? How'd she know she healed? Pain and arthritis in her knee, obvious, huh? She had, uh, she had uh, arthritis in her knees, a lot of pain, and she said it had been hurting today. And I called her, and she said she felt something, and the pain left. And it's gone. It's gone. Good. 
Who else in the room? Somebody want to tell me? What, honey, right here on the front? What was that, like a tendonitis thing? What was it? Okay, just from work and you just said on going. It was hurting right now. It doesn't so it was hurting when they prayed? When you were asking if anybody had arthritis pain and then I, yeah, it doesn't hurt anymore. Gone. It's gone. You were in your chair when I asked people to stand? Yeah. So you were one of my eight? Yeah, because okay. I had stood already, but then I... No, that's yeah. good. You stood. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Anybody else you want to share? You, there was a lot of hands. If, if God did something and you want to tell us, yeah. Go ahead, man. Yeah. Uh, so, like, uh, I do jujitsu, and uh, I don't know, like four or five weeks ago, I tore my MCL. You tore your ACL? MCL. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, so yeah. The inner, the inner band. Uh huh. So, uh, I don't know. Every day I've been practicing, like, trying to do this with the other side that's tore. And I can't hold it up at all. Cause right, there's like, things that you weren't able to do because it would strain and stuff. Yeah, so yeah. You, so uh, more than the healing, I just wanted to believe that the Lord loved me no matter what, you know. And so, like, he's like, check it out. And I was like, okay, well, look. And this is the one that's tore. And I was like, what the You're heck? doing it? Yeah, that's the one that's tore. I couldn't hold it up for more than a second. That's awesome. That's crazy, right? Yeah. That's good. Man, you guys getting this? Come on, this is awesome. Okay, let me ask you this question. Let's do one more. Somebody want to do one more? Yeah, yeah honey, let's do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, first of all, I didn't want to stand up because my hands, well, they always hurt. And then when you said that, I was I'm like, I have to stand up. And they don't hurt. You were one of my eight? Yes. <laughs> and another. Who else? Wait a minute. Who else of my eight knows you're healed? Raise your hand if you were part of my eight. And you know you're healed. One, two, three. You? Four, five. So is there three? Is there three that didn't feel change or what? Is there three that stood up in the back? Did you stand up? Were you one of my eight? Did you not feel change yet? Somewhat. Okay, yeah, we're getting to that. Is there somebody else? Who's my other two? What's your situation? Is it arthritic, though? Did you stand up when I said the arthritic thing? Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Okay. Have you felt any change yet, or is it the same? Okay. And who else? Same? Didn't change yet? A little bit, okay. Share your testimony, okay. Oh, okay. So we got nine. Okay, so something's going on as you're standing there. And we're getting to that in a second. Actually, she stood up and wasn't directly afraid. It was injury, stuff like that. So, so I got my eight. You share quick. We're going to be patient with me. I know this seems a little long right now, but this is good, and it's going to teach us something. You're going to really enjoy this, okay? So uh, trust me, just hang in there. Go ahead. I've had cancer twice, and God's healed me from cancer, but I've always had just this pain, and it's completely gone. Completely gone. Was it 24-7? 24-7. How long? It's all good. Five years. Five years. Wait a minute. Is that why you're crying? It's hitting you, right? Watch this, guys. This isn't just, well, my pain left. Watch. Five years, 24-7, it's always there. And now she's crying because she's realizing, wait a minute, it's not there. We're not jamming her favorite song. We didn't hype her. We just touched her for six seconds of sincere faith. And Jesus took it. Five years. 24-7. See, that's why she's crying, because that's her reality now. And so don't ever take this stuff lightly and think, oh, wow, okay, stomach pain. Five years, 24-7, gone. That's not an accident, guys. That's not hype. That's not mind over matter. Cut me a break. If it was mind over matter, we'd all be better because we want to be. It's just the craziest thing I've ever heard. That's good, huh? Father, we just thank you for wholeness. We thank you for what you're doing in her. There's been like a health thing, cancer, a couple times come to your life. Can I just do something? I want to pray something. Believe with me, church. Father, I thank you she's not a target. Don't you even think you're a target. Don't you even think you're a target. 
No, don't you even think you're next in line for nothing but his love and the victory that he paid for. I'm telling you, you're not a target. Don't you look over your shoulder. You look up from whence comes your help. I declare over you wholeness and even a protection and just a covenant. Man, I see like this covenant hedge in your belief, in your sincere believing that you know what? I am not a target except for his love, his grace, his mercy, and his goodness. Sickness shall not touch you. You shall remain whole and be well. In fact, this faith is rising even now in your heart to believe for people and see the glory of God. In fact, I feel like you've always had that in you and you always felt like your desire to see has, has the, the things you've seen have, have, have not seen. I mean, have always surpassed your desire to see. And I feel like God's going to let your eyes see what your heart's desired. And I feel like this desire to see people restored and made whole is going to rise up and burn in your heart. And you're going to get involved and you're going to stretch forth your hand and God is going to move even as your pains left from your stomach tonight. You will see things leave people's lives. And I feel like I hear God say, I'm going to put you on a roll and you're going to get confident and you're going to get bold and you're going to see my glory before you. And even the way you saw it leave you, you'll see things leave others, and you're going to do it again and again and again. And I just see you having a very big heart to see the deliverance of people. So I bless you with that. You're a woman of health. You're a woman of God. In Jesus' name. Oh, that's amazing. Good. Wow. That's awesome. Because I just, I just heard all that in my heart, and you are not a target. I just, You're a woman well, of God. Pastor Joseph that leads this, I'm his assistant, and, and just running hard all the time wears on me, and I know that I was like, God's called me to do this, and my body was just, I was like, no. <laughs> and so this, I just feel like it's freeing me up and yeah, just you're, to go. You're going you're gonna to walk in a grace. There's a freedom. You're not a target. You're going to run well. I see health over here. Empowerment. I see this thing burning in you. Amen. Yeah. Can you tell them about the deliverance you do with the women locally? Can you tell them that? And I also go to strip clubs <laughs> and minister to the girls there Yeah. for deliverance. And, uh, there you go. So I'm telling you, what you saw tonight with this, you're going to see again and again and again with your own eyes through your life. Again and again and again. Yeah. Okay, okay, real quick, stay patient with me. I know it's late for you guys, but it's way later for me, so have mercy. Who felt somewhat changed? You just didn't raise your hand because it's not all the way, but you know it got better or it changed. Go like this. Let me see how many you are. There's a bunch of you. Let me see you. Is your person still here? Is your person still here or did they leave? If your person's still here, grab them. Are they still nearby? Raise your hand so they can see you. Look around, guys. If that's your person, look around. Go grab them again. I want you to pray six more seconds. Do not change your prayer. Say, pray the same way you prayed the first time. Okay? Can somebody, is, is, is her person there? Go for it. Just pray. Thank God for the increase, but thank God he's a finished work. There's a man back there. Are you needing prayer? Fine. Who, was, who was with that gentleman back there? Somebody go get with him. Go get with him. The man back there with his hand up. Yay. Six seconds. That's all I want. Just pray right now. Father, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. You're a finished work. Complete wholeness, Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah? Come on. That's long enough. Thank God. Now let's do this. Let's do this. Check your bodies real quick. There's probably 18 of you, so I didn't count. Check your bodies. Be patient. Check your bodies. And if it changed that time or got completely better, I need you to go like this. Are you listening? I know you all having fun talking. Check your bodies. Who went from better to, to whole? Yeah? Yeah? Good. Who else? Your body changed that time and it went, it got even better. Yeah? Good. Good. Anybody else? No, that's awesome. Look what God's teaching us. 
Don't let go of what you believe. Keep believing. If you pound something and it doesn't move all the way, pound it again. Believe the same thing. Bam, bam, bam. Better plus better plus better sooner or later is wholeness. Now, if, I think we have time for this. It's the last thing I want to do. Who's still in the room? You're still paying attention. You're still here. And nothing changed since the first time we prayed. It's still the same. Let me see your hand. Don't be ashamed. Don't think heavy on it. I need you to be honest. You're still the same. It didn't change. Okay? Don't feel funny about that. It's amazing how we've taught ourselves to think like we're like the egg out of the basket or something. Listen, don't let it change faith. Don't let it change truth. Don't let it speak. Let Jesus' life speak. Faith is not a point in time. Let me see your hands real quick. Nothing changed yet. Is your person still here? I want to do one more six-second thing. That's all I want to do, and then, then we'll close with prayer. Touch your person if their hand's up. Don't get somebody else to pray. Don't say, hey, I'm going over there because they got healed. You pray. Six more seconds. Come on. Six seconds. Please, let's do this. Pray for them. In Jesus' name, be whole. Just stay with us, guys. I know it's taken a while, but it's just good. All right, receive his love. Believe he loves you. Don't strive. Okay. Out of those dozen people that raised their hand, there was at least a dozen of you, I guess. I want you to check your bodies. Check your bodies. Go ahead. Stop talking for a minute. Check your bodies. Pay attention so we can do this as a group. Is there anybody in this group? Check your bodies. That Nothing changed, but that time it did. Check your body. Nothing changed, but that time it did. Go like that so I can see you. Did yours change? No? Yeah? No, that time? Okay, I got one. Do I have anybody else that I'm missing? That time something changed. Let me see you. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Okay, good. What's that teaching us, guys? Never grow weary in well-doing. Never believe. Faith's not a point in time. Come on, we got to drill this down and get it. So what's your response when you leave here tonight? Thank you, God, for what you're doing in me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for changing things. Even if it didn't change, same faith. You guys got that? All right? Let's keep living this way. Let's keep believing this way and keep seeing God move this way. Does anybody need to close out or, or... Hey, Chris, anybody need to close? Love you guys. I'm done, yeah. Hey, we just want to thank you for coming out. Um, doors open here tomorrow at 8.30, so make sure you get in line. 8.30, the doors open tomorrow. And a reminder for all the parents, there is no child care. You're free to bring your children, but you just have to watch them, all right? So have a good night, guys. Thanks for coming out.